Well, I'm going to talk slowly until Julie shows up and David. Um, but my name is James Pepper. <laughs> Can we just go around and do an introduction of everybody? Um, I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Board. And today is January 31st, 2022. And I will call this meeting to order. Be more center if you can. Um, so again, today we're going to attempt to make it through the remaining comments we've received on rules one and two, including some that we received over the weekend. Um, just a reminder that the comment window um, has closed for rules one and two. Um, that's not to say that members of the public can't continue to um, submit comments and really help us identify gaps in the rules. Um, only that, um, especially after today, we might not be able to guarantee that we can review them like we have been of, for the comments that we re received to date. So, um, but reminder that the official comment window is open for rules three and four. So, um, you know, we're going to be going through a very similar process with those rules. So please, uh, members of the public, turn your attention to those two rules and um, help us kind of figure out how we can improve those. So um, with that, uh, Julie and Kyle, have you had an opportunity to review the minutes from our last meeting on January 27th? Yes. Yes. And I would take a motion to approve those. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So um, we left off yesterday or on uh, Thursday, um, just Friday? Thursday. I can't remember. Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. Sorry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> we left off um, just kind of at a, a natural kind of breaking point, I think, with Rule 2.9. Um, so why don't we pick up there? And then um, we have uh, Carrie Jaguer um, with us um, from the Agency of Ag to help us work through some of the testing um, rules. Then, um, David, just for your benefit, I was thinking then we would turn to you know, we got that general comment about all the reports that we're requiring from licensees, and it might be helpful with Carrie's kind of guidance. You know, he's been through this sure. the yeah. program to review which, which ones are necessary, which ones might be superfluous. Um, and then we have a few cleanup comments that we received, you know, on Friday and over the weekend that I think we should look at. And then um, just a few other kind of outstanding issues. We'll take a lunch break and hopefully we can vote on the final rules after the lunch break. Sounds good. So if you could just pick up where we left off, I think it was 2.9. But... That's right. So I'll uh, read the comments here uh, and then, you know, Carrie's here to help us out. So I'll open it for discussion like I have been. And just as a reminder to folks watching, all the substantively different comments are included here. It doesn't mean that every word of every comment is included, although the board has reviewed all of the comments individually, so they've all been seen, but this is all substantively different comments. We are going through every single uh, substantive uh, input, piece of input that we got. So I'll do two comments here um, at once. Commenter recommends that the board maintain testing for STEC, Salmonella, and Aspergillus. I apologize for my lack of knowledge and how to pronounce some of this stuff and adopt standard action levels. And I'm going to lump in another comment here. Uh, another comment says to add testing for total yeast and mold. Gary, I don't know um, how you feel about this stuff, but we're going to rely on your expertise here. Um, Comment one, I support, yes, yeah, Salmonella. So the conversation in the work group um, with the doctor, you have to help me, Kyle. Dr. Dr. Hom. Dr. Hom. Yep. Um, really brought us around to looking at only the contaminants that are human pathogens. And while the hemp program still maintains testing for total yeast and mold, um, the reason for that is it may or may not cause cause harm. Um, focusing on human pathogens, as recommended uh, by Dr. Haas, is where the working committee landed in the end. Um, 
thoughts are that the market will will absolutely moderate any yeast and mold on saleable flour. Um, nobody's going to purchase moldy flour, or if they do, it'll only happen once, and it'll it'll take care of itself very quickly. Um, and remediating those products into and edible or somehow some other way extracting the product is one other way to deal with the yeast and mold issue. Yes, my understanding is that yeast testing for that too can be burdensome mm -hmm. on our smaller cultivators too. Yes, and right now we have not set standards in the hemp program for yeast and mold because uh, the results vary and the impact is is unknown. But not only if we require testing for yeast and mold, it would also we would also be required to set suitable levels. Yes. Yeah. I think yeah. we stay where we are with no yeast, no yeast and mold right now. But um, you know, I know we're also talking here about is it STEC? I, I don't want to get the the acronym wrong. S T E C. Salmonella. Uh, yeah. <laughs> these are these are what Dr. Hom has his specialty in is, is bees, mm -hmm. and we did say that these would be we would put these into our our rules, but those action levels would be determined through board policy, so we can be nimble. Should there be you know advancements made or or health risks identified? Yeah. And also, I think David, do you include the caveat that uh, other contaminants as the board profit in the rule? Um, um don't remember, but we certainly can't. I don't remember if it's in there right now. Yeah, that, that's we do 2.9.4 has the uh, salmonella, the human pathogen language. So it is certainly something you can capture if we start seeing a lot of moldy, moldy flowering and as an adulterant pull. Stop saying we're pulling off the shelf without uh, specifically setting a gotcha. level. And I did just see here, I remembered here, the 2.9.11 does give the board broad authority to add yep. parameters like that. So we're just going to keep it. So it's covered if it becomes an issue. Yes. Yep. So just keep it as is. Mm -hmm. And again, we'll develop those standard action levels through policy. Sounds fine to me. And most, you're saying that mold is kind of easily identifiable visually. Mm -hmm. So um, people aren't going to confuse it for something else. No. Okay. So there's kind of a natural check that's built in already to, I mean, retailers don't want moldy products on their that's shelves. True. So, okay. Um, there was a comment related to this, and I don't know if it's covered or not, but there's a, the, we received a comment over the weekend um, recommending to include a mycotoxin test as an additional test. Um, any thoughts on that? It is important, and um, we can go back and I can share with the board the mycotoxin results from hemp grown in the state. I don't believe any have been positive for mycotoxin. And then again, if it becomes an issue, it's covered under the catch all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is the power. Let's see. You can read it. It is true. Let me, I'll respond to that uh, in writing for the for the board. Okay. More specifically about mycotoxin. So are we gonna just keep where we are? Now and if that, I, I would suggest yeah. Okay, we're not seeing any sense of how expensive a mycotoxin test would would it add anything? Not to the cost. Uh, not sp specifically. No. Okay. Um, there are a number of my mycotoxins. There are quick assay tests. Um, twenty five twenty five dollars is a mycotoxin screen. Okay. All right. David, I think no change. Great. All right, got that down. Going to the next one. The commenter notes that uh, 
the rules should explicitly address failed tests and allow for remediation. It goes on to say, with mandatory testing for STEC, Salmonella, and Aspergillus, many operators face the issue of batches of cannabis failing such tests. While preventing these batches from reaching consumers is good for public health, this could also lead to significant financial losses for cultivators, as destroying a batch can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Currently, the regulations do not address procedures in the event of a failed test. While the transportation of failed product is contemplated, it is not clear whether or how operators can remediate, fail, remediate failed products in order to bring them into compliance. Most states address this question by allowing for the remediation of cannabis and cannabis products as long as they pass a subsequent round of testing to demonstrate compliance with stated action levels. So I could be I could be wrong, but I thought we've been generally receptive to allowing remediation for everything but a willful um you know i think it was, that was our last conversation about it yes yeah so are we just not is it because that language isn't also strictly in this part of our roles or and it's elsewhere or i think we put it in like the pesticide you know part of our rules but um do we need to i would suggest that you allow for remediation of everything except for human pathogens okay if there are human pathogens this is like the lettuce recalls you see, you know, that would, this involves something explicitly harmful to humans and you don't allow for remediation. That's unfortunate, but if you were to get any of these specific pathogens, it means your sanitation needs help. And if you were to sort of use the Food Safety Modernization Act as an example, this is, this is not something you want to see in supply, but all of the other listed contaminants that you're looking for, there are ways to remediate those products. So we should, so we should be clear in this section, I guess, then to allow for remediation for everything other than human pathogens. And then we also have that same kind of language in the, in the pesticide mm -hmm. portion of our rules that allow for remediation unless it was done willfully. Yep. Yep, that makes sense to me. Got that, David? Yep, that sounds good. And yeah, we do have the remediation part in the adulterated cannabis section, so we can also work in a reference. I'll, I'll figure out how to draft it, but a bit of language in, a, in a human packages will be carved out for this piece. Um, so this, I, I believe we actually took care of this comment already because it was the substance of this is actually in another section, but I'll just read it out. Uh, harvest lot potency, uh, the three weeks before harvest time frame is not representative of the potency of cannabis flower. Um, potency should be tested uh, after harvest and be labeled on the product. You guys already decided to change that accordingly, so we'll move on unless there are any other. Well, what, what was the language we ended up with? I wouldn't mind Carrie having a chance. To oh, yeah, absolutely. It was... Um, before packaging, essentially, the testing should happen before packaging. Yeah, that makes sense. You want an as sold. You want an as sold guarantee. Yep. Yeah, great. Okay. Okay. Good. Um. Next one. Looking at two point nine point two, which is the uh, potency parameter, I believe. Um. The commenter asks, "Is this parameter? Is this testing parameter too tight?" and notes that for hemp, there's a 20% variance allowable, according to the commentator. I haven't independently checked that, but Carrie okay, can verify. Um, commenter says with a cap of five milligrams per serving and an increase in demand for microdosing, 10% may be difficult to obtain and will result in large amounts of waste. That, that's accurate, and I do agree with it. When you're talking about a concentration, a concentrate, you know, when capped at 60%, um, that's 600 milligrams per gram. And the 20% variance or 10% variance makes sense when you're talking about five milligrams. That's 10% of that is 4.5 to 5.5. You're not going to be able to see that with the analytical variation of the instrument or the whatever it is that's being marketed, whether it's a gummy or something. Um, in that case, 10% is too tight, and I would recommend that you sort of tier that. So the 10% apply to your 50% and above. Okay. And I think something done 
down around five milligrams, even a 50% tolerance is okay. Because 50% gets you from what, 0.25 up to 7.25. Yep. And if you're eating a gummy that's 0.25 it, up to 7.25, you're not really going to discern a difference. Yeah. That's fine with me. So what? Sorry, what was your suggestion? For I'll write it down percent. for you. Okay. 10% 10, 10 at 50% and above. And then tear it down to so maybe percent or fifty milligrams. Fifty percent. Um, oh, I see. Tolerance of so if, if you're above fifty percent, even at thirty percent, you're going to be able to see the difference analytically because you're talking a difference of a number of milligrams. Okay. And that, 30% that's three plus or minus three milligrams at five milligrams. That's half a milligram difference. And when you take your gummy, dissolve that in a solution and run it through your instrument, the analytical variation of the instrument is going to potentially be larger than your cutoff percentage. So your so the the comment here about disposing of product based on those levels is accurate. And, I, and I'm suggesting down at five milligrams, even a 50% tolerance will be okay and won't necessarily, you're not shorting anybody, you're not overdosing anybody because the difference of a milligram or two in a product isn't going to have a discernible effect. How do you um how do you get to this level of variance? Is it someone that accidentally puts in too much uh, you know THC isolate into their gummies? Is that the problem? And then we don't want to have to throw them away. If well, test high. So do you form you formulate your product. If you're making gummies, you put in all your ingredients and your batches for 20 gummies, yeah. and you put in a thousand milligrams and mix it all up and put you know, yeah. you're you're trying for five milligrams in each this might be a batch, variance. but there'll be a variance just yeah. based on. People have an incentive not to do this, honestly. It's like giving away free THC. Correct. So, yeah. so I, I don't have any problem, especially on the lower ones yeah. uh, on that. So why don't we just follow the suggestion here, David, if you're okay with that. Yep. It's how do you get a representative sample? Right. How do you analyze accurately and then how does somebody that's formulating in the kitchen get a scientifically accurate result? It's sort of like making chocolate chip cookies. Every chocolate chip cookies, one's going to have 10 chocolate chips, one's going to have three. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, for, that's an oversimplification, no. but. When you're in Elkar. Use the chocolate chip cookie on here. Um, to clarify, I thought where you were saying that follow the suggestion of the commenter. Follow the suggestion of Carrie. Okay, got it. Yeah. I, 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 Terry, is everyone okay with that? Yes. Yeah. If you'd yeah. like that written, I can send it over as helpful. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, so another commenter going to section 2.9.4 says or recommends that the Cannabis Control Board consider adding to subsection 2.9.4 the following. Aspergillus species, quote, Aspergillus speciation testing shall be performed using a qPCR method or alternate DNA-based method on sample material that has been enriched in a medium that promotes fungal growth for a minimum of 24 hours, end quote. Specific? It would help with that. That's definitely one of the labs commenting. Is it okay? It, well, I don't know. Probably. I mean, someone, it's probably Sherman Hahn, honestly, but he was helpful in drafting yeah. it. Yeah. So. It's either Sherman or uh, Bia. And oh, do it quick outreach to the commenter. And if that's the, I mean, I don't know if you have to do it specified. Get that specific in statute. Yeah. You want to use a method that works. Right. So any 
board verified method should be allowed to to analyze for that compound and um, specifying QPCR is extra. So any board Would that be cost prohibitive to certain labs wanting to test for that specific? N no. Okay. But can that does this methodology change from time to time and we don't want yes. to change our rules every mm -hmm. time? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds so like something we can put in guidance or board policy. If somebody has QPCR, there's soon to be a test kit for it. Okay. And a you know mass produced test kit that uses sort of a DNA based method is bound to hit the market sooner or later if it isn't already there. So it sounds to me like we need some sort of catch all somewhere in 2.9. I think we have it already in 2.9.4. It says the following pa human pathogens will be measured and the limits set in accordance with guidance okay. issued by the board. I would I would say that in accordance with guidance issued by the board applies to both the measurement and the limit. Yep. Okay. And I think that makes sense for all the reasons you guys are saying. These methods are going the methodologies are going to change over time and we shouldn't set those in the rule. Yep. That sounds good to me. And I think specifically here, he's talking about a fungal growth for a minimum of 24 hours. If you run a six hour test, you're not going to see it as well as if you run a 24 hour test. So as long as the board verifies that the method that the lab is using is sufficient to answer the question, if it's there or not, you're good. Right. That sounds good. Gary, just looking ahead, I see that the next comments don't really apply to your expertise. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we pause. Because the next comment that I see is moves to 2.10, which is about integrated licenses. So I'm wondering if we pause and try and use Carrie's time wisely here on the areas that I think you really um, should be weighing in on. That's good to me. Yep. Is that right, David? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we why don't we knock out um, Rick Fox's kind of few points that he wanted us to touch on specifically? Uh, let me just pull those up. I mean, I know the first one was around whether um, we should allow. I see these two issues as interrelated, so I'll just say them both. Whether we should have we we apply a plant count um, equivalent for our first two tiers of outdoor cultivation. So we allow um, 1,000 square feet outdoor cultivation or 125 plants. And then for tier two, it's 2,500 indoor or um, 312 plants. And that's based on a formula that Rick has kind of given us. It seems, seems legit, seems defensible. Um, Three to one is fair. Yeah. And so it's essentially... Um, trying to accommodate how people grow, recognize that there might be kind of, uh, you know, buffer crops that you want in between your cannabis rows. Um, and so, you know, we're decoupling just canopy. Um, from Comment really is, should we allow that all the way down the line for all six cultivation tiers, that same equivalency? Um, and then I think a related comment um, he asked for is if we're going to just do canopy size, do we allow for non-contiguous rows? So the only canopy that gets counted towards your, you know, cap, your 5,000, 10,000, et cetera, is for the, the rows where you're actually growing cannabis. So my um, take on this is not from the grower side. It's right. not from, it's from the control board and the inspectors. And you want something easy to, easy to measure, easy to count, easy to determine compliance. You wanna be able to determine compliance as fast as you can. And I think extending plant count makes it a lot easier because if you're measuring canopy of non-contiguous rows, you're gonna, your inspector's going to be there all, all day with a measuring tape, and it's probably going to take more than one person. Um, so you're either going to have to team up the inspectors to go and measure canopy that's going to change over the course of the growing season, 
to determine compliance or you know send one guy there who can do a quick count of number of plants and not every plant is going to be alive you're going to have row skips like so i think plant you know, again with uh some standard variation is going to allow your inspector to cruise through an inspector more so than measuring plant canopy even if you were to do that with aerial surveillance um, yeah. you're going to have a much quicker time determining whether somebody's compliant basically with a finite thing to measure yeah. and i think the easiest way is plant count i, I mean i don't want to sort of tell you all what to do but i think just for ease of inspection plant count will make it easier when you visit a facility and it was the sort of the same conversation about indoor grow room size in the the ask to only count the canopy in there instead of the size of the grow room it's really easy to measure the size of the grow room yeah. if you're measuring if you're taking out the aisle space and then it then compliance becomes subjective and i think you want to take subjectivity out of determining compliance the non-contiguous row is probably not a, a great idea from just a workflow perspective um, on our end. What about having the plant equivalency? I mean, for the um, larger tiers, which would clearly, you know, it, it poses its own challenges, honestly. Like, you know, our highest tier, 37,500. So you're talking about, you know, what, 100,000 plants potentially? Really? Outdoor? I don't know if it's that high. Well, yeah. I can't do the math in my head quickly, but it's. <laughs> So it would be a divide by a thousand and multiply by 125. So I can't, I could do it, but <laughs> it's not that many plants. I mean, no, it's a uh, hemp. You were getting less than 2,000 plants sorry. on an acre. It's um, it was 46,000 plants, roughly 40, almost 47,000. That's on three acres. That's a three acre plot. That, that's on a 37.5. If we applied the same ratio, so like three to one, the, the 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 equivalent, the ratio that we're using is a thousand square feet equals 125 plants. If they're playing in the grid, it's still easier to count plants than it is. It's still easier to count plants. Okay. Than square footage. But I, yeah, I'm just saying, like, we could say that it had, like, that 37.5, the plant count equivalency does not apply and it has to be a contiguous plot. Is, does that make things a little bit easier? Not to mention, we're requiring fencing for that level so we can kind of just follow the fence and count. And yeah, at that point, yeah, either way, either they both make sense. But like I said, you want your. Your initial, but you don't want this to be subjective. Right. So whatever it is, it needs to be measurable. Um, and I think we ought to do that math again because a, on an acre, people were putting about 2,500 hemp plants, and it sounded like you're going to squeeze them a little tighter. So I think that uh, 37,000 is closer to. Less than 5,000 plants. Less than 5,000. Maybe I did the math wrong. Well. Can I just clarify our two sort of decision points here? Yeah. One is about contiguous rows. Right. Right. And then the other is about plant count. Right. But we already, I think we already talked about contiguous, that the that the um, square footage need not be contiguous. So do we, are we feeling like we're going to change that? I'm hearing that. I'm hearing that it could be problematic, particularly on the larger cultivation tiers. Okay. So the alternative, I mean, that's a moot point if we go to, I guess it's not necessarily a moot point, but it's less of a pivotal point if we go to plant counts. Mm -hmm. So I, for all the reasons that Carrie's suggesting, I, I think plant counts are 
good idea. Yeah, I know I've been the one that's been that's been cautious, and that's for other land use planning, you know, issues. I think um, some folks are going to be challenged to get through Act 250, depending on what they're yeah. planning to do. Um, especially if that impact, and whether it's a couple thousand plants or or more, spread over larger than an acre. It's an incentive to keep keep your grow small. <laughs> right, isn't it up to that person, that yeah. cultivator, to decide? Okay, I'm going to plant these things far apart and have two. I mean, that would be up to them to to navigate that. Not that it would be fun by any stretch, but it would be up to the cultivator to decide that. At that point. All right. I think we, Kyle, all I'm suggesting is you make it easier on your team. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally. I guess my my thought is is. And maybe I don't need to play this protector from Act 250 jurisdiction, but I feel like it's part of my job to do to make sure <laughs> that I'm not letting folks into that black box, which can be a black box. Um, recognizing the district coordinators have yeah. their own semi autonomy to help from a commercial impact perspective maintain the integrity of their specific district. And so I don't know how any of them feel about cannabis, and so that's kind of where my yeah. My fear comes in a little bit. Um, we'll see if the Senate makes it all and that removes the act. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I think I'd want to see what the plant count numbers are. We need somebody who's good at math. I'm not that person. <laughs> so, so I know. Help us scale it up appropriately. I can do that. Yeah. Um, look, hemp, we're like an acre. You were reserving about six square feet per plant. So that was 43,000 divided by six. And we're talking here. You did eight, right? I had eight of the equivalent that we use yeah. in the lower tiers. I think I was just off by a factor of 10, honestly. Now I'm looking at this. So it's 46, 4,688 plants for 37,000 square feet. So, yeah, it's, I was off by a factor of 10. Sorry. Uh, it's, 4,687 yep. is the number of plants that uh, the tier six outdoor cultivator could grow under those ratios. And we'll quick clicker, that's still one person. What would the, tw I don't want to make everybody else do math on my behalf. What, what would the, <laughs> what would the 20,000 count? Uh, we had a 20,000 square foot canopy and then it jumped to 37.5. So what would the, 20,000 equivalent be for. Would you divide by eight is what you were. Mm -hmm. You tell me, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I was taking math in high school, so. <laughs> 2,500. Yeah, 2,500. Okay. <clears throat> Which also, you know, when they're young, if you did pop a drone up in the air, you've got a record. I think it helps growers in the sense that, well, what, like, you know, 30-ish percent of plants are going to fail, with, um, likely regardless of what you do. So it, it helps. Yeah. It helps from that failure rate perspective, mm -hmm. too. What I'd like to do is propose one for that 20 million square foot equivalent and I'm steering to allow for some jumping conversations here. But um, I thought it might be appropriate time to raise it up to add a mixed tiering license type or tier that would be that 20,000 square foot equivalent and then have a small indoor kind of like the inverse of how we've been looking at um, the mixed tiering thus far just for the folks that are growing a lot of outdoor plants providing them some indoor canopy um, from other plants for vegetative stock and um, you know allowing them an opportunity to have an indoor grown plant if, if that's what they would like to do as well to 20,000 outdoor yeah, what was that number equivalent again? 2,000, 2,500? 2,500 plants and then 1,000 square foot or 2,500 square foot indoor? I don't know. We got to crunch the numbers on that one again. I mean, you know, Carrie, one thing that we did was we just created some mixed cultivation yeah. years because we figured that that, you know, achieves what Kyle's talking about, which is allowing people to kind of have a you know, cultivation room inside, trying to move some plants outside, um, moving for the winter, have some continuous 
So, you know, we were just pulling numbers pretty much out of the blue. I mean, well, you're going to have to until you see what the market right. and growers produce. Yeah, and I think thus far we've we've done some, you know, plant counts tied to some of the smaller indoor licenses up to like 5,000. But I'd like to see one where it's folks that are pretty much all set on sunlight, outdoor grown cannabis, but still need a small indoor space as well. Yeah, you got it. So the tiers we did were 1,000 indoor, 125 plants outdoor, then 1,000 indoor, 250 plants outdoor, and then 2,500 indoor, 400 plants outdoor. Um, those are, all, yeah. yeah, those are the tiers we ended up with. And then I think Kyle suggesting uh, 2,500 indoor plus how much outdoor? 2,500 plants. Outdoor, 1,000 square feet indoor. We can do the thousand square foot indoor, but I didn't necessarily want to provide them the small cultivator exemption if they have such a large outdoor footprint. Um, we can talk about that. So it might be better to jump them to a a twenty five square foot, twenty five hundred square foot indoor category instead, just to kind of be clear there. But um, I don't know how either one of you feel. That makes a fourth mix cultivations here right. right that's what we're doing okay. it's a fairly large jump between 400 plants and 2500 plants well i thought that about 400 plants was about seven i mean you guys are the ones doing math correct me if i'm wrong was about 7,000 square feet and before we made this tech to plant counts i was thinking okay do we want to do this for 10,000 square foot outdoor canopy and i'm like ah oh, we're already almost there then we might as well go to the, to the next highest one. And that's kind of why I made that decision. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, we've, we've almost accommodated folks that would otherwise grow in that 10,000 square foot outdoor license type with the 400 plants was what I thought. Almost, not necessarily. So people who might do this would have a large grow outdoors, but would be able to keep their mothers indoors, would be able yeah. to start their, you know, their starts might be indoors for a little while or, you know. Yeah, that's the job. That would be the purpose. Well, I mean, in my mind, that would be the purpose of that. Have you all separated indoor space between flower and veg? No, because the definition so. of plant canopy is all living plants. Okay. It's it seems to me just that this is kind of an odd like an odd license type compared to the other ones. Like I want to have some kind of rhyme and reason between this. It seems to me like what we've said is you know, twenty five hundred and 400 plants is maybe there's no logic to that one maybe we just need to just jump that tier to a larger just like eliminate that tier change it's 2500 indoor and 25,000 or 2500 plants outdoor but it seems to me like we're kind of losing any sort of like rhyme or reason to this mixed cultivation tier i would like to just kind of look at what the plant count equivalents for each of our outdoor tiers is going yeah i mean to be. I'm, I'm getting and a little you, i'm getting a little lost in all the numbers that right. we're throwing around too i need to see it on a piece of paper yeah but, so um, we're going to take a lunch break why don't we just finish this conversation after the lunch break all right and okay. just and we'll we'll during lunch break figure out because what i was thinking is you're essentially combining a tier one and a tier one and then you're combining a tier one and a tier two right and then a tier two and a tier three and like I don't, I just don't know how. Like there was some internal logic consistency to it, and this just seems like a pretty significant jump. But maybe it's not. I, I'd like to. Just I think there's just a lot of numbers that we've been discussing, and it's hard to keep track of. Yeah. Of where we are. When there's a problem you're trying to solve, right? Is that we've heard in comment that people need some indoor space, even if they want to cultivate primarily outdoors. outdoors. Yeah, and I've, you know, we're we've been approaching the mixed tiering as you have your indoor square footage, and you get a a plant count as supplemental to that indoor or at least that's kind of how i think it's being perceived and i think what i'm hearing is folks that are growing indoor over 5,000 square feet don't necessarily have a vested interest in 
maintaining an outdoor stock. So um, as much as it might on the inverse. So I'm just trying to meet people who are looking to pursue a larger outdoor license to provide them some availability to have some stock inside. I think it makes sense. And I think people are going to do it regardless of whether or not we allow them to. Right. And you otherwise can't combine to cultivation licenses, no. right? Yeah. So that would be the only way to do it is to create. Yeah. So, okay. I mean, what I'm hearing is generally people recognize that we just need to sit down with these numbers and actually see them on a piece of paper to kind of figure out what's the right ratio to apply to what. Yeah, but I do think we need to decide today also. No, so, for yeah. sure. So let's, let's do that after lunch. <laughs> Carrie, how many, just in your kind of just wildest imagination, how many 20,000 square foot outdoor cultivators do you, do you think we should be expecting? Okay. Any, any, any <laughs> venture, you want to venture a guess at all, or is that just kind of I, I haven't seen your latest license structure. Um, Folks growing outdoors are probably going to have a combination product. They're going to have some boutique flower, some outdoor grown flower, and a lot of what's there is going to go into extract to be sold as a concentrate or ingredients for an edible. Okay. So they're going to be have, going to have to be large enough to have mixed outputs. Yeah. Um, so twenty thousand feet indoor outdoor outdoor which we've changed to plants which was 2500 plants yeah. boy that's about the level that 90 percent of the hemp growers jumped in at yeah and that's manageable yeah. 2500 plants is very manageable with two or three people outdoors okay um and it really depends on the license fee Okay. Right. I went there recognizing that we likely won't even open the 37.5, at least initially. Okay. All right. So I think you will see a bunch of people jump in at that level, but it's it's not, that's not a lot, that's not an insurmountable amount of work. Okay. And again, I thought those other in intermediate tiers between the 20,000 square foot and small cultivator level outdoor, I thought we got close to accommodating those specific outdoor numbers and plant counts already in the mixed tiering. So we had up to what, a 400 something. And mm -hmm. I thought that almost got to equivalency of about, you know, 7,000 square feet. Again, I'm not a math expert, so don't quote me on that, but I'm like thinking, oh, do we make an accommodation then for the 10,000 square foot grower or do we just jump to the next highest license tier? So that's kind of where I arrived at what I arrived at. Okay. But again, I think we all just need to see it on paper again. <laughs> Okay. All right. Then let's move. Let's move on um, for now. I think that captures most of Rick's comments here. Um, can we jump in. So we received a general comment um, regarding reports that the board is requiring um, and plans that the board is requiring. Um, so again, the comment was just basically, you know, anytime you require a report. Um, make sure that that information is actually valuable to the board. Otherwise, you know, where are we going to store it? Is it a public record? Um, what are we doing with that information? Becomes um, kind of burdensome both on us and the, and the licensee. So um, David sent me a list of all the kind of reports that we're requiring. I'm going to start 1.4.4. Um, which is um, these are plans that we're requiring as part of the application process. And we made some changes. So I'm looking at the, the updated version. So all applicants must submit a health and safety plan. They have to submit a storage and record keeping plan, submit an inventory control plan, submit a contingency and continuity plan that addresses the dispersal or disposal of inventory in the event of an abrupt closure. Submit a timeline for beginning operations of the cannabis establishment. And the last two kind of are attestations. So those aren't really plans. So, um, but do you see good logic behind these and are they necessary? And are they necessary for all called all license types in your in your view, having just been through the hemp program, you know, 
or lessons learned from that? It really depends on how much hand holding you want to have over. Do you want to ensure success or do you want to let the market do that? Um, and what are the elements in what are the elements in each plan? Like you're saying you need the plan, but what's a health and safety plan actually mean? Is that where do you go during a fire drill? Like what what level of detail are you asking for? And are you do you really need to be privy to that information? I guess is the question. It's it's accurate and fair to ask for that during the application process because you want to understand how much effort and thought has gone into each proposed business. Um, but is it but is it up to the board to decide whether that entity has done their due diligence or not? You have to assess exactly how much hand holding is appropriate given that it's a new industry and you're trying to help people learn how to be regulated yes yeah i think that's one of the you know how we look at these i think that's that's really how i've so i think i i've put forth a lot of the plans you know not necessarily these ones but especially in the cultivation plans and the you know energy usage data records and, and what we're looking to accomplish and it's like Recognizing that market dynamics are that some people succeed, some people fail. How much do we as a board want to help certain folks reach a degree of success and plan for the inevitable worst case scenario? And so I think it's just where we draw that line in the sand. And I think some of our requirements have erred on the side of, you know, protecting people from themselves a little bit you know, and anticipating failure. But again, is that the role we want to play? And I think to your point, Carrie, at the time of licensing, I think we do want to know how well thought through folks have done in terms of their initial application and plan. Do I think we need updates, regular updates, when they change that plan in the middle of their license? No, probably not. We have health and safety training requirements, mm -hmm. and I just wonder if we actually need a health and safety plan. You know what you don't want to happen and we have a golf course permitting program and originally no golf course get through the act 250 process then finally one did and they used dilution calculations and different methodologies to do a risk assessment yeah. and then 96 golf courses copied that plan right I mean, that's going to happen in this industry. I like, I just know that a lawyer is going to look at this and create just one document and charge his clients $10,000 for that document every time. And, yeah. and then, and we're going to get the exact same one every single time. Um, so does that get you what you want? I guess is right. What I exactly. Getting. And I guess the kind of more fundamental question is, are we going to reject an application because this we believe is unsatisfactory or maybe doesn't meet some kind of threshold. And then that's really a discretionary point for us. And um, no, I think it would be it is there or it is not right. Yeah, that would be the. I think we can get rid of B, a storage and record keeping plan. I mean, we require the records to be kept. I think we don't need to hear a plan about how you're going to keep them. Um, one inventory control plan just be accounted for and seed to sale? I think so. So what do you think about D, Carrie, the, the, the contingency and continuity plan to address a, an abrupt closure? And yeah, that's a keeper. Yeah. That's right, true. because about your seed to sale is all about diversion. Right. Mm -hmm. And if some place closes, you want to know where that material is going, yep. even if they don't know originally. That's yep. having a plan in place is appropriate. Okay. Are you thinking of striking A through C, or you want to keep A? I um, 
there's too many very too many pieces in my opinion to the health and safety plan because you're going to have slips trips and falls yeah a plan for that a plan for evacuation if there's a fire mm -hmm. and then you're going to have all the worker protection right. piece associated with pesticide use so your health and safety plan is going to be a very thick document so a through c we're looking to strike I'd get rid of A through C on this one. I honestly dealt with slip strips and falls of OSHA at the federal level. Yeah. Right. Okay. <clears throat> that sound okay? Yes. Yeah. All right. David, we're going to strike A through C on this. Gotcha. Um, all right. 1.6 is the next one. Pepper, did you want to cover the last part of 1.4.4? Just the, the employee stuff? Yeah. I mean, you don't have to. Just wanted to make sure you. So, so it's applicants who intend to hire or who have hired employees, an overview of the positions and staffing levels, overview of the general roles, overview of the management structure, employee hiring and training plan, including safety training. So isn't this where we would get some of our um, information for the applica application prioritization that we need to do? Yeah, I think, I think that's why those are important. Yeah. H and K because isn't one of the 903A requirements or the um, priorities, isn't it not having a plan like that? I think that's where that came from. What if we say, what if we tie it to those criteria where if you have what is, what do we say, three or more FTEs, then you have to I forget how we structured that. It was Two or more for a certain number, and then ten or more for uh, another number of two. selections. So what if we had two to ten, you had to pick one of one from both, yeah. one from a couple categories, and if you had over ten, you had to pick three from. So what if we just say if you have over two, then you have to do H and K. But how? So then, how does how do one point four point nine and nine hundred three A set? Like how? Because there are two. Like what if you don't choose to do the hiring plan? as an option from those 1.4.9 selections. We still have to prioritize the applications based on certain things. Based on the 903A pieces, right? So I think that's fine as long as we figure out how to marry those two together. <laughs> the 903A. Um, OK. The 903A is, yeah. Seriously, I mean, I think you're talking about the positive impact criteria and just knowing whether somebody needs to fulfill certain levels. Yes, and that regardless of what somebody fills out in their positive impact criteria, we have these prioritizations that we have to do right. for applications. In my mind, the some of the where we would get the information to do that prioritization would be in these H through K. Without having to have some other separate so just leave it for now. Or piece of that. Yeah, I think so. I guess inherently this has a one a one employee minimum before this kicks in anyway. Okay. I don't think that that's overly worried. Okay. All right. We'll leave it. Right. All right. Nice try, David. I'll okay, try let's go back here. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, 1.6, the requirements in this section apply to applications for manufacturing licenses. Manufacturers must provide a list of intended production items and means of production in a format determined by the board. So this is, again, a report. Um, and the thing that struck me about this is we're not asking for kind of mid-year updates or new product updates. Um, and so really what's the value in this if you know they you know some manufacturers going to list some potentially intended products something's not on there there's really no penalty there's no like we're not going to ding them for anything or if they add a new one after they submit this list there's no like consequence to that so this to me the intended products doesn't really necessarily add a lot of value so how and given that how will we get market data and what will we measure it against so if we don't have it in the application as a baseline 
then down the road, what will we measure our market data against? Well, we have point of sale tracking information. Right. So we'll know everything that's been sold, and including just interest supply chain sales. So, and that could cover that. So you don't. It doesn't sound like, in, and you're thinking that we would need a baseline before the market starts. We would need to start collecting that when the market starts. So. Okay. Jerry, do you see value to this provision? I haven't looked at it as a whole, yeah. and I think it makes sense to know if your manufacturer is an extraction lab versus a bakery type. Like if you're if you're making food or you're making a concentrate. Um, just walking in the facility, you know, it'll let you know if you're dealing with pressurized gases and solvents versus butter and flour and gelatin. Uh, but if you've got somewhere on the application that says I'm I'm a manufacturer that's producing concentrate, like I'm a I'm an extraction facility versus I'm a this could be a checkbox, not a list. Yeah. yeah a list, a checkbox instead of a list of products. It would be helpful for you to know what the facility is because okay. a manufacturer concentrates are, you're making concentrations in vape cartridges as a different facility. Mm -hmm. It's like going into Korea. You've been in Korea. No, you haven't. Yes. I haven't. Oh. Been. Okay, <laughs> so they take hemp flour extract it. They're making tinctures and extracts and vape cartridges and all sorts of CBD products. They're not making gummies. They're not making bakery products. Um, those are made elsewhere. Part of it will we'll, we'll make up for it with which type of manufacturing yeah. is in somebody's seats. Right? As long as you're capturing it somewhere. Yeah. Is there a value to our inspectors knowing at the time of application when they go back what they're looking for? Probably. Oh, you're going to know immediately once you walk through the door. Right. <laughs> and if you're doing all, like if you're prepared to do, you know, an inspection, almost like a commercial kit, kitchen inspection, you're looking for temperatures and sanitation as opposed to has your solvent been purged fully. It's a different inspection. But I think to your point, operationally, this could be a radio button yeah, or like yeah. a check. It doesn't check have to be like a yeah, onerous. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can we clarify that in the role here, David? Just that, you know, I, I guess the clarification would be like product manufacturers don't need to provide a list of intended products. They just need to kind of attest to their production methods, as in like, are you a commercial kitchen or are you doing solvent based extractions or both check all that apply yeah okay Sorry. <laughs> and really i think it would come down to potentially just if you're a tier one product manufacturer are you doing both yeah. right okay i'm cool with that 1.7 retailers must provide a list of intended sale items this is the same Pretty much the same conversation. We don't need. We don't necessarily need this, right? For the same reasons. No, I, I know. I know. We talked about this, and you know, I don't. We would expect them to provide it at licensure, knowing that things change, and we wouldn't ask for it again. So, I think a checklist though is helpful. Right. Yeah, what do Just you intend to? Yeah. I would imagine most intended to sell as many different types of products as they could. So the checklist would be for kind of 1.7 sub B. Yeah. So are you going to sell items that contain CBD, hemp, hemp drive compounds, or that is consumable that's not intoxicating? Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that make sense, David? So you're saying that the list will. Will it be a, a check mark as to whether it's a yes or no to sub B or a list that includes anything that might fall under sub B or the same as what we have? 
I think it, just because we don't know, we like we don't know the architecture of our licensing uh, portal quite yet. That you could probably just leave it as B, and then we could just because it's okay. Just leave B. Got it. Just leave B, and then we can create a, hopefully create a checklist on the application portal. Allow you to either check a box or enter it. In. Sounds good. All right. Um, next is two point three point one. This is um, pesticides cultivator cannabis. Establishments with a cultivator license will report to the board regarding the use and quantity of pesticides, if applicable. Do you require this in other areas? Yep. All right, then. I think we keep that one. Leave that then. Yep. Okay. I would suggest you don't make them report, they just keep the record and make them available upon request. Okay. You don't need a report of what they use. Those shall maintain a record yep. of the use and quantity of pesticides. Mm -hmm. And that's so, in our regs as well. Does that sound good, Julian? Mm -hmm. Yeah, wherever we can mirror what's going on at the agency bag and the program, I think it, it helps all folks not feel like they're up against two different standards. Yep. You got that, David? Yep. 2.3.2 F. Visitors must be logged with time of entry and exit, and log will be made available to the board or designee upon request. So logs must be retained for one calendar year. This isn't necessarily a report. This is more along. All right. Program. So I think, sorry, F was for the the uh, rule as filed. You're looking at the um, looking at the amended one. Yeah. So it's a different F now. Um, I think the F that we were that that was re referencing was the safety protocol must be on record with the board, and you already decided to delete that provision. So they just need to have the protocol, but they don't need to file it. Okay. So I think we're all set on that. Sorry. The no, it's fine. Oh, There's like three different versions of this rule. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll move on from that then. 2.3.8. Um, cultivating licensees shall submit cultivation and operations information to the board within 60 days. The information shall include the cultivation schedule, the grow medium, the mixed lake cultivation plan and schedule, irrigation plan and schedule, waste management plan, pest management plan, and a plan to secure regulated products such as pesticides. I feel like F and G are the same. If you want to know the truth, but that's only how I think. I kind of felt like getting rid of G. Like yeah. I, I know we we've talked a lot about this as a board. I just don't know if anyone's going to say anything more than I'm going to go to the store and buy it. Right? Yeah, no, I'm going to order it from Amazon. Yeah, I'd like to keep that management plan though. Yeah. No. Yes. Okay. That is very important. Okay. But yeah, I'll strike yeah. G. Okay. Um, do the rest of those make sense to you, or are they superfluous or unnecessary? Nope, they're good. And do you want to impose IPM? Like integrated pest management would be, you know, you have mites, you're going to use lice wing larvae instead of neem. You know, and when do you want to impose IPM here? It's sort of the same tact you're taking with. Um, Packaging, like you're imposing an, an environmental benefit on a on a entity, and in this case, IPM is the best strategy. It's not just spray and pray. You need to know what you need to identify the pest, target that pest, and control it. And it's largely an opportunity to put in statute. Uh, best practices, most envir environmentally friendly practices, as well as sort of produce cleaner cannabis than any other state. So I mean, I like the sound of that. I was trying to signal yeah. that with test management plan, but if it's not clear enough. So integrated, integrated pest management plan. In, in F, not just pest management plan. 
Is yeah. there any reason to waive that for tier one cultivators? No. No. It's not going to kind of push people to stay in the illicit market because it's too. No, because they're doing it in the illicit market already. Yeah. I think they know and can anticipate the issues yeah. that they currently have, and okay. it's just kind of formalizing that kind of brain trust that they've built, you know? Okay. I just have a question on G. Is there are, are there already rules about how pesticides are handled? I yeah. think secure is yeah. not obtain. It's secure as in like put in a safe place uh -huh. for G. So, but there's already there existing are. rules around that. Okay. Okay. So, how should we say that an integrated pest management plan? Yep. Yeah. Okay. That, that term's not unfamiliar to folks. Okay. It's defined in the regulation. Why don't we do that then? And then um, irrigation plan scheduling, that's that's all relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. You don't care about irrigation? I, I think we, you know, my thought is it's not, most people are not going to be impacted by that. If we were in a state with a different water resource profile, I think it'd be a lot more important. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So why don't you get rid of D then? And then what about the mixed light cultivation plan and schedule? I mean, we're trying to, with the mixed light, trying to kind of like let people have a little bit more flexibility. But if we tie them to a plan, you know, maybe it doesn't, it reduces the flexibility for sure. And then are we going to really, when we go there, are we going to compare what they're doing to their plan? Well, we might just in the sense of, so our inspectors know where to look, right? And to ensure that there's no unaccounted for plants, right? I mean, it might so you help. You have to submit that. a diagram of what they're yeah. doing now. So it's kind I think, of. I think we can strike it and just okay. let folks be flexible. All right. And then cultivation there's, schedule makes sense, I think. Yeah, I think we, for our, our market dynamics, need to kind of recognize yeah. when things are going to be. Grow medium is indoor versus outdoor. Now, grow medium is the style with which you're growing your plants. So, there's different different ways that you can grow different soils soil that you can grow. Okay. Soil looks media. So is that a good one to keep? I think so. I yeah. want to know that information. I want to know how folks are okay. are growing. What's the most successful way to grow? Well, could people change it? Like if you started off one way, could you change in your indoor? Would somebody change it to save a plant? I don't think that they would change something that yeah. foundational to their grow operation mid, okay. mid cycle. But Gary, I don't know. You're not going to change it mid cycle, but you could be doing multiple. Yeah. You could have your mothers in soil, your clones go soilless, you bring them the flower in a soilless media, media or hydroponically. It's You wouldn't care if this was you? No. But I mean, part of what we're trying to do early on, and I know this, like, I'm not trying to micromanage this market, but part of what we're going to try to do is to anticipate overages and underages in supply. And this might help us understand uh, overages and underages. The only kind of thing that we are, I mean, the, the kind of thing that VS told us to really look out for is how much outdoor versus indoor, just because mm -hmm. they're kind of like four to one, five to one turns. Yeah. But uh, does this, this like, if someone's growing hydroponically versus in soil, would that significantly change the supply, the amount that they can produce? I think like how is this information going to actually be useful to us? Why don't we strike it? We can ask it in surveys. Okay. All right. Wow. So then, so we're leaving cultivation schedule. We're getting rid of grow to medium. <laughs> we're getting rid of C and D. We're leaving E and F, but we're changing F to integrated pest management plan. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, last one <laughs> on the reporting. Is this is a big one? This is the energy usage one? So two point five point six. So license holders must report energy efficiency and water performance benchmarks annually to the board. Um, license 
holders must annually update and submit to the board written operating procedures regarding equipment maintenance, calibration, and proper operation for all major energy equipment, including um, horticultural lighting, HVAC systems, dehumidification. Um, and then license holders must annually assess and report to the board opportunities to reduce energy and water usage. There's a number of um, kind of subcategories there. So this is, you know, obviously this is valuable information. I don't want to like, I don't want to suggest that it's not. I'm just wondering um, what, uh, how much of a burden this is going to be and does that burden, um, does, do the benefits outweigh the burdens? So this essentially really, well, I'd be fine with waving it for small cultivators. I'd still like to see it for the larger cultivators so we can kind of recognize our impact as Vermont looks to meet certain climate goals. I, I think we would be unwise to to completely strike the whole section, you know, I think. But every year is that needed? Other states ask just simply for the usage, right? The energy and water usage. Do I remember that correctly? I believe so. Yeah. Um, okay. Why don't we waive this one for just tier one? I think that the like calibration, proper operation, stuff like that, you know, if I was a young entrepreneur trying to get into this business, all this stuff might be just seem like, what am I doing again? How do I do this? How do I comply with this? Um, but anyone who's got kind of enough capital to be, you know, getting these things probably wants them maintained. And I think we all have an interest in them having being maintained um, properly and properly calibrated. Um, yeah, you know, I think the downside is that if we waive it for 20, well, I don't know how many small cultivators we're going to get, but our data will always be incomplete if we ever knew we need to report out on our footprint, so on and so forth. But you know. So is the data that we're trying to get from this, the cultivators, way that they've identified use or ways to improve their use of energy and water, or is it how much they are using? I think there's elements of all of that. Okay. This is a recommendation from PSD, right? Yep. <clears throat> Look like you're thinking about something. You know, I'm just wondering where, uh, if, I, I, if I were to do this, and I was going to, like, I have no way to meter that was always water. Cool. It comes out of the backyard. Like, yeah. How do you, how do you measure water if there's no way to I'd have to install a meter to gauge how much water I was using to get rid of water performance benchmark? Well, no, no, I'm I'm not weighing in and just sort of thinking about how how that would happen. Um, and I think you know it would be interesting to separate at the facilities where the water is being used because i think you'll find that you're using less to keep the to produce the plants than you are to maintain sanitation or process water right mm -hmm. why don't we focus on energy and less on water performance okay i think it's measurable happen. you can definitely Measure it, and the energy is where you can reduce. You can reduce to get rid of water performance in in a. If you were, if you were, I mean, looking at the numbers, it was what roughly ten acres that we need statewide. Seventeen. Seventeen. That's not even a small cornfield. Yep. Water 
water's a tough one in the northeast because we're not we're not on irrigation. Nobody's got water rights. It's just it's here. I don't meter it unless you're on a municipal right. system. Okay. When we look at C, this is um, license holders must annually, and again, this only applies to really indoor cultivation and, and the kind of mixed light, the indoor portion of the of the mixed cult, mixed tier cultivators. So, um, licensees must annually assess and report to the board on opportunities to reduce energy and water usage, including identif identification potential energy use reduction opportunities. I mean, this is all good stuff. You know, I don't know if requiring us requiring everyone to kind of annually report that I started out with the most efficient light bulbs and I'm going to continue to use them um, makes sense but maybe there are ways that they can push them towards solar or renewable sources or something I don't know thank you I'm sorry no yeah please I I just I'm I don't know if it, this again, I think probably was a recommendation from the Public Service Department and Efficiency Vermont, and mm -hmm. the folks that they consulted with. I think it's good to constantly be pushing people to reevaluate where they're at. And just as a reminder, I had it in my notes that B and C of this section were waived for tier one cultivators, not A, but and then otherwise it's applicable generally. I'm thinking like, what if we just waive the annual aspect and push it like right. biannually? Biannually. Biannually. Right. Every two years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. And then eliminate the water again, water usage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then, um, how long is your license good for? A year. A year. And again, this, this adds added burden to the licensee. But if you don't ask for it every year and you have a. I know, that was what I was just thinking in my head. <laughs> yeah. If you're going to ask for something every other year, you need to tie it to a renewal or some other mechanism so it doesn't put the burden on you to ask for it. Well, why don't we just leave it annual and get rid of water and just leave it, mm -hmm. and we'll see how people we see what we get. To it next yeah, year if it's come back untenable. to it next year. Yep. Okay. That's it. All right. So the reporting; those are all the reports that I that we found or I found um, or David found. Um, we did dealt with the Rick Fox issues. Um, last one, Carrie. While we have you. Um, you know, we had a pretty um, good conversation last week about um, requiring either compostable or non-plastic renewable packaging. Um, this gets tricky with the childproof packaging, like the tie into that. Um, a lot of the childproof packaging requires a certain amount of plastic. Um, whether, you know, even if you had a glass jar, the lid sometimes, you know, in order to be compliant, has to be plastic. You can use all metal. Um, there are metal factories. Um, I think I would like to. So, child resistant packaging to me is kind of a carry forward from Colorado, the early legal states, um, when it applies to flour. And I, because, you know, in my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if a child under five, which is usually the threshold that they use for child resistant packaging, consumes flour, um, they're not going to have a psychoactive effect. The, yeah, the THC is not psychoactive. It needs to be decarbed right. by burning mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. right. cooking. So while it is kind of a political landmine to try and change that because every state has carried forward the definition of childproof packaging. I actually Washington State has recently changed their um, definition. It says childproof packaging shall be satisfied by 
so long as the person who gets into it won't be poisoned by the material. So you could you can change it to kind of a poisoning standard, um, mm -hmm. you know. But again, that that requires a legislative change because the definition of child resistant packaging is in statute. Um, so setting that aside, um, what do you think about us trying to go down a path of requiring packaging um, to be compostable or non-plastic renewable? So more and more we're finding that the compostable plastics aren't. Um, but I, I I like your standard. I like that standard. We Wait, when you say not, uh, you mean are you meaning that composting companies won't take them? No, they, they don't break down. They the polymers don't, don't break down like yeah. we think about the word compostable. They they break down under a very specific set of circumstances and even then they have a mixed bag of results so instead of yeah. composting organic material might take one to three years the biodegradable plastics are there three to ten years and it's not a, yeah it's just not like there's a an push among the composters to sort of have those compostable plastic bands because in a compost pile, you can't really distinguish right. between non compostable yeah. plastic and non compostable plastic. So I I was trying to capture, and maybe it's just captured in non plastic reusable. Um, there's a whole brand, uh, a whole series of brands of cardboard child resistant packaging these days. Um, and I was trying to capture that, but maybe we just consider those as non-plastic, renewable, or reusable. Mm -hmm. Anything you can do, same with the IPM, anything you can do to move away from plastic, I think, pushes this industry in a progressive direction. Yeah. So the IPM, the lighting standard, the least toxic pesticides, and moving away from plastic packaging is... Uh, going to be what creates the Vermont brand yeah. and that's what you guys are sort of in charge of yeah so we're gonna we looked at the language from Colorado last week which uh, permits licensees to reuse to collect and then clean and then reuse um, even plastics but you know so we're going to include that but then the step further would be to just require no plastic mm -hmm. so collect does ag plastic fall into your definition of no plastic? I think you're talking about packaging in containers, but yeah, right. we're tackling that. No, no, that's fine. I meant bioplastic. Well. Sorry. Oh. Plastic from agricultural feedstocks. Mm, hemp. Like PLA. Like yeah. I've worked in corn plastics. <laughs> yeah. So my mind always goes there. And they have, mm -hmm. again, a very mixed bag of success at this point. Some are also biodegradable and compostable, some are recyclable. They're not all compostable. So, I mean, I was going to use the definition that I chose is pretty technical, but it's the one that's in the single use plastic uh, bill that passed in Vermont. Um, and I, I don't know the answer to whether or not the bioplastics would fall under that, but I would assume that if they're not actually a benefit, you know, that if it's not, if it we're just creating a bunch of new plastic waste that's actually not doing what it's supposed to be doing, then I would not include it, no. Is your language, it has to be 100% non-plastic? Because the jar that we talked about last week, right. the top of that is still plastic. You know, I would like to see no plastic, I think, you know, and I, I would like to pursue a fix if the board's okay with it on the child-resistant packaging for flour. Yeah. And, the, and then that would open up a lot of opportunities for, for us, yeah. um, I think, on the flour side of things. And then, you know, if we need to have some small allowance for a lid, you know, the problem there, the door you open there is that sometimes the lid, the childproof lid, has more plastic in it than the, right. than the pop top, like plastic pop top. Right. But the two similar jars that I have in my office, one is for flour and the other one had a drink in it. So you would want the childproofing for the for the, the drink. drink. Yeah. yeah. Definitely any sort of edible, anything that, yeah. you know, is psychoactive upon consumption is um, needs the child, child resistant yeah. packaging. Um, I just think we can get there without plastic, though. I think if you require it, the market will respond. It might be a little bit of a kind of there might be some friction 
um, in the initial uptake, but I think I think it's good to just say that's the direction we want to I'm go. I'm fine with it as long as it's available. Like my only concern is having product that can't be packaged because we've made a rule and the packaging isn't available. That would be my only concern. Yeah. I'm on I'm on board. I think let's let's go with your single use plastic definition that stays silent on bioplastics for right now and we can always through policy kind of amend that should we find out recycle or recycle right. cycle haulers don't want to accept it. That, okay. Does that sound like good? Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. Because then hemp plastics and whatever else bioplastics would would be allowed. But I just know that they're they're contentious right now. I know that the I think the legislature has been talking about bioplastics too. So, yeah, I'm going right to go on Thursday and talk about microplastics and compost. All right, let's do that. All right. That'll be it. We'll see the exact. I'll work with David over lunch to get the exact numbers we're going to do it uh, before we kind of make a final decision. But I think that's a good one. Um, that is it for you, Carrie. You're right. more than welcome to stick around if you want, but I think the, the rest that we have to talk about just really doesn't involve kind of agricultural practices. Yeah, very good. Very good. Thank you. Great. Well, David, can you jump back in? I think we left off at 2.10. Sure. Uh, before you go, Carrie, can you just get me the language you were thinking of on the potency yes. parameters? Yeah. Thank you. There we are. Okay, so <clears throat> moving on to 2.10. Um, let me just pull up the right spot here. Leave it out in the middle of office. That's great. Thank you. This is about uh, co-located co operations specifically with respect to um, integrated licensees. And 2.10.3, somebody comments on subsection D that uh, the recommendation, they recommend allowing integrated licenses to commingle inventory until they reach retail. Requiring separate inventory will cause the business to incur double the costs. That double the cost because they have to track it separately. I don't understand why that. I thought we said they could come and go as long as yeah. the inventory yeah. tracking can distinguish between. I think this comment came before. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. I think this comment came before we had that decision. I think this was a the trade association submitted a letter with a bunch mm -hmm. of comments. And we we're still kind of like drafting the rules. Mm -hmm. I think we've already accommodated that that's allowed. Yeah, we say yeah, I think it can be clarified. I'll just clarify that it's it's at retail that it has to be separated. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Two point ten point four. This is the duty to maintain continuity of services to medical patients. Somebody comments. Um, integrated licensees should be permitted to purchase product. Um, to sell to registered patients through medical dispensaries in an effort to ensure medical patients have continuing access. Oh, sorry, tax and retail, I meaning a regulated market to sell to registered patients through medical dispensaries in an effort to ensure medical patients have continuing access to product. Um, so, and then I, I think that this is related. Let me read the next paragraph here. The inventory tracking and transfer of product between medical and adult use it only be an issue if the integrated license tier sizes are over the maximum allowable amount for adult use. I would suggest including language that details the need to separately track or transfer inventory from medical to adult use, or that the need to separately track or transfer inventory from medical to adult use could only apply if the total canopy for both operations is above 25,000 square feet. This should simplify things dramatically while addressing the board's concern that integrated licenses would try to use medical cultivation to increase their tier size for adult use. I don't really even know how to begin to unpack this. Yeah, I need to um, look at this. 
So I think the first part, let's take it one part as like two separate issues. The first part is just, I think they're just asking about um, It's essentially letting the integrated licensees purchase from other cultivators if they need to, which is already permitted, right? It's already even required for a window of time. Mm -hmm. well, I think the, yeah, I mean, I'm, so I'm interpreting the first part of that, but right after the bullet point to just say you can transfer from adult use to medical, which I think is already true. We already are allowing that. You can go from adult use to medical. You can't go from medical to adult use. That is, that is correct, yes. So I think the response there is just this is already, it's already permitted. permitted. Yeah. Currently, dispensaries are allowed to source from other entities, I believe. So, yeah, it's different for going the other way. Um, and then this next comment. I think what they're basically saying is the only issue here, the only way we gain an advantage is if we are effectively able to grow a larger cultivation tier than anybody else. You are allowing us to do that solely to the extent we need to, to provide for the medical market. They're saying if we're not even getting to that plant canopy limit, then it shouldn't really matter because we're not utilizing whatever advantage we might have. I think that's the argument that this comment is trying to make. We're only requiring knowledge of transfers if you're transferring above whatever the highest tier is. That's right. I, I sort of, that's, yes. My take on this is essentially the same as the last one, which is that I think basically the rule already says this. Right. We're, we're not even, as long as that sort of bubble that, that the integrated licensees get to have above the top of the cultivation tier is only really going to come into play if they are at the top of the cultivation tier. If they're not, it's just, it just doesn't matter. Not, don't, there's no need to measure it. It's just not relevant. So I think effectively, I would say the same as the prior comment, this is already what the rule provides for. I think it is clear that there's going to have to be a lot of um, guidance, shall we say, and conversation with enforcement to make sure that all that is clear but i do think that that's what the rule says now okay. yeah i i agree that that's what the rule says but i think that's why it was hard for me to really understand what was going on here but um yeah hey julie and kyle do you no, want to I, make any I agree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um there is a a supplemental comment that we received over the weekend just around 2.10.4. More of a question, honestly. How are we going to enforce the kind of maintaining continuity of products and services? And how are we going to enforce the like commitment to maintaining three months of biomass? I mean, this is a condition of their license, so we have ways to enforce it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, 2.10.5. The comment is that this section should clarify whether a dispensary can purchase or transfer product from the adult use cannabis, cannabis supply to the dispensary side. And I think the answer is yes, but it doesn't actually say that plainly. It's just not prohibited. Um, transfers in the opposite direction, again, are prohibited to avoid that sort of like unfair advantage that the board has been worried about and that many we've got many comments on. Um, the clarification happened in rule three and not rule two. I mean, this is about the integrated license. The rule three is about the dispensary. Seems like if we don't prohibit it here, then we can clarify in rule three. That's fine. I think that's really just a drafting issue. Either way is fine. But I'll, I'll note that we can clarify it in rule three. If it needs clarification, I'm not saying it does. Um, Looking at 2.10.5D, this is purely a drafting issue, just okay. highly technical, yeah. <laughs> just making sure that it's clear what clause was being referred to. 
uh, when you're looking at sub section D, it says the cultivation will be subject to, to the limits of subsection B or just to subsection B. Um, but we're really talking about a um, the cultivation tiers in subsection B. There's also other stuff in subsection B. Anyway, we don't need to go into that. It's just a drafting issue. If you trust me on that, I think it'll be fine. No meaning change there. Um, now, here is one that is more substantive. Um, the, the recommendation of the board does, in fact, allow transfers from the dispensary supply to the adult use market with the explicit permission of the board. Well, they are commingled, right? And so really, this is kind of like this is allowed. And but if it's above, if they're transferring too much, then they do need explicit permission. So this, I feel like, is already accounted for in our rules. Am I wrong? Did we? I thought we took that. Well, wait for the right answer. I mean, so I, I think that what they're saying is what I understand this to be saying, giving it the sort of benefit of of you know of the doubt in terms of um, fitting it in with what the rule says now. Um, I think what they're asking for is saying, hey, look, what if we actually did make too much for the medical side? Can we now transfer that? And right now it says that no, they can't. If the total in it, the last sentence of subsection D1 makes that clear, it says if the total biomass set aside for medical cannabis and cannabis products is ultimately not needed for that purpose, it may not be transferred to the adult use market. So that's again, if they're already in that bubble area where they get to go above the maximum cultivation tier, can they then? It, this won't really matter if they're not above that. Can't they just store it? And you know, like they're maintaining a three month supply, so eventually that supply will be depleted, right? Can't they just store it and save it for the? Yeah. Set it aside for medical patients. I think there's other ways that they can make up for their own mistake other than transferring it into the adult use market that's just an advantage that nobody else has and i'm i wouldn't support yeah. allowing them to do that right that's their business wrong not our duty to make up for their mistake okay yeah that's good i think it's fine the way it is next substantive comment is on 2.10.6 uh we're asking that permanent there be a permanent requirement that 25 percent of integrated licensee purchasing must be from small cultivators and i've got another comment that's related to this also which is again more of a question we received it over the weekend just this section right here how are we how is this going to be enforced what how do you define available like the if available so um and I agree with the questions. I have the exact same questions. This seems like a very challenging uh, provision to enforce, um, mostly because you know it's saying 25% of what is sold has to be sourced from small cultivators during this window. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to know what's what 25% is until the window is over. That's right. So it's just like. You know, the legislature put this provision in. I understand the intent, and maybe this is one thing that needs some clarification um, in our rules. I, like, I just, I don't know how to, how an integrated licensee would achieve this, other than we are requiring them to submit a plan on how to achieve this. And we can say at that point that this plan is insufficient. What I would hope that they would be doing is saying, I've set up relationships with these 10 small cultivators. I anticipate maybe selling X amount um, and during this window, mm -hmm. and here's how I'm going to source it from small cultivators. Yeah, but as far as the permanent goes, right. I don't know. If it, permanent to me is a legislative change. Agreed. I think that if people want this to be permanent, they really need to go kind of lobby uh, their local representatives. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think it, it belongs in statute, not necessarily in rolling. You know, recognizing the the internal politics that exist in the cannabis community here, it, it those they're not always this requirement is, isn't reflective necessarily of some of the politics that exist. You know, I don't know if small cultivators will want their products at one of these establishments, and then we're diving into market dynamics and relationships that are part of business relationships, not the regular yep. regulator in the business relationship you know so and we heard early on that that may not be the case they may not want to sell to integrated licenses yeah that's their right and you know then we're going to be making waivers if they can't meet this and, right yep okay 
Great. And then um, the general question, all this probably could have gone in a packaging section, <laughs> but as I look at it now, uh, somebody asks, is white labeling, white labeling allowed? Can licensees transfer products from one licensee to another at various points in the supply chain? And just to give the lawyer outlook on this, I think the way the rules are now, it certainly is. Yeah. There's nothing that we mandate or prohibit with respect to branding. Uh, certainly products are allowed to go back and forth between licensees. Branding is totally a commercial question for the licensees to decide on. We know that retailers can't package. <laughs> for now. That's the only for thing now. for today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, agreed. I mean, it okay. is well. Yeah. yeah. And I think we all know that this isn't a linear supply chain. It's going to yeah. bounce yeah. around like a ping, ping pong ball. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And then I'll, uh, there was a couple of questions that came up. Uh, I'll go through them one at a time here. And then there's some sort of, I already have some suggestions here about how to manage them. But one of the suggestions is really just how do we deal with interaction with the municipalities who do have some limited authority with respect to local control commissions and, and um, decisions that they might make? And how will we know about them? How will the licensees, how will that communication happen with licensees? And so in response to those comments, um, and, it, and just so folks remember or know, there is nothing in the rules at all right now about that. So the proposal, I think, would be if the board wants to, would basically be to put in a few, four different items, which is that municipalities should notify the board if they create a local control commission, because that will then become a factor in a licensing decision. Um, and they should notify the board if they deny a license, if there is a local control commission. They should notify the board if they suspend or revoke a license. And grants are, and the local control commissions do need to make decisions about licenses. They can't use that as a reason to effectively prohibit licensing. There has to be some reasonable period of time in which they make those decisions. So those were a few points that were responsive to comments about increasing clarity around how we'll be interacting with municipalities. And this, um, the timeline for making decisions, I mean, that's sort of in line with what permitting is like too, right? It's, a municipality has to make a permit decision within a certain period of time. Do we have the authority to do any of this though? I mean, it does, the section 863 of our statutes explicitly says that the board will make rules regarding municipal uh, authority and the local control commission. So I think we were explicitly granted authority to make rules about this exact set of okay. issues. One of my questions though is that do we have the authority, it says the board will not require local approval as a condition of an applicant pursuant to 863C unless the board has received notice of the creation of a local control commission from a municipality. And that basically and unless a municipal, the way I read that is any municipality that doesn't have a local control commission is mooted out of the process unless they create one. And That's right. Do we have that? That's by statute. By st yeah. But if you don't have a local control commission, you don't have the authority to deny a license. You have all the other authority to be clear. Sure. <laughs> I Me mean, reading that, not knowing that, I'm like, I don't know if we have the authority to do that at all. So. You still have a local municipality would still have all of the zoning authority, like okay. all of the other permitting would still have. They just would just not do this piece. OK, that's right. No local control commission means no local license under the statute, not under our, not under anything we're doing. That's the legislature's Sorry. decision. It's that. Well, no worries. The step is obscure. So I think any we should, with any no, we should do all those things. Okay. Yeah. And then the the final piece was a comment that came up uh, in the last couple of weeks, just about the complexities of what we might see. And, and Pepper had actually brought this up during a conversation. I think you brought it up during co-location, but it's potentially broader than co-location because it could be examples of people renting out equipment for other people's use and perhaps the person running out the equipment might not have otherwise been a permitted licensee because of the one license rule or some other reason um, and so there's some concerns about end arounds effectively around our fundamental licensing requirement or potentially around the one license rule as well 
And so we already have in the co-location section, we have a sort of catch-all that says, hey, if any of this co-location stuff is effectively subverting the one license rule or the basic licensing obligations, you have to, um, you know, the board has the authority to enforce accordingly. And but that was really limited to co-location. And the point I think has been raised by uh, at least one commenter that it's not necessarily going to be limited to co-location type situations. It could be other types of situations. So effectively, the proposal would just be to add that broad catch all to the rules as a whole instead of just to the co-location piece and just say, hey, if there's commercial. Um, partnerships, commercial arrangements going on that are effectively subverting the one license rule or the basic licensing requirement, then the board still has the authority to step in. And that sounds very pretty. Yep. And that was it. We've reached the end. Let me just see if there's anything left on this. <laughs> Again, hold on. We've reached the end of this compilation. Yeah, okay. Not the end. Uh, Can we revisit the background check? Yeah, well, there's one on section rule that we were section two or rule two that we got. Section 2.13. Yeah, it's just a no specific recommendation, just interested in the scope of this. Okay, so there actually are a number of. Right. So here's the here's the situation. It's quarter to one. Um, I'm pretty hungry, but I do think that we could actually knock out just the rest of our comments pretty quickly. Just the rest of the ones that we received over the weekend. Um, and yeah, the criminal history, uh, use of criminal history records. We do need to uh, warning labels. Um, you know, I did reach out to the Department of Health. They gave me some responses. And then um, we do have to do an executive session on social equity criteria. Do we want to do those now or do we want to take a break now? And David's going to need some time one way or the other when we're all done to make these changes. So um, if we do them now, he can do it during our kind of lunch break. If we if we break now, he might have to do some now and some later. David, which would you prefer? I'll put my vote behind that option. Um, I I don't have a strong feeling. I mean, I, I think we could keep going for a little bit now and see how go for like a half hour or more and see how far we get. If that makes sense. I mean, I think we can get through all this stuff in half an hour. If we can, that's great because it is easier to make changes all at once because things interact with each other, so it's easier to okay. to do it all at once. Bryn and Nelly, are you yeah. hanging in there? <clears throat> Okay. So let me just finish up the comments that we received yesterday at five o'clock. Just go through <laughs> some of those. Um, again, this is about adding mix mixed light. Uh, I think we've been pretty clear on that. Um, that we don't have to really do anything more there. Um, insurance. We fixed the insurance piece. You know, this is about reducing the insurance rates for, for the insurance requirements for small cultivators. I think we've done that. Um, definition of what enforcement training is in section 2.2.5. I think we can do that in guidance. Um, the uh, seed to sale tracking, inventory tracking is prohibitively expensive for small craft cultivators. Um, there should be some way of sliding scale or waiver. Um, it's not really something specific to our rules. I don't, well, I mean, I guess we could waive, waive it, but. Um, I don't want to waive tracking for anybody. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. We don't know how much it's going to cost yet. Yeah. This could potentially be something that the Cannabis Development Fund uh, looks into, the people that oversee that money, having subsidized seed to sale tracking, subsidized testing. So um, we're not going to waive it. But um, another question about the initial transfer of living plants into the tracking system. I think we all kind of understand uh, what the law requires there. Um, and so we're in that box, but we don't know what our tracking system looks like. We don't know how to bring plants into it quite yet. So um, we don't have to make any accommodations in our rules quite yet, I don't think. Um, warnings and symbols for THC content and child safety are cost prohibitive. Uh, I think we need those um, in our labeling standards. 
for doing business here. I think here. it was in the legislation. Yeah. Um, social equity allowing cannabis establishments to use photos and Im imagery so long as they're not using the products. Um, we've talked a decent amount about social media. Or, media. Social media sorry. Social media. And I think we um, have addressed that issue. I think that's in our kind of parking lot for year two. Um, mostly because I think of the 15%. Um, allowing family, me are family members considered visitors, um, even like if they, in an emergency situation, need to step in and take over the operations of a business? Um, I, you know, I, I think if someone, if a family member does need to step in and take over a business, that it would be the change of control, like notifying us about change of control. We have rules around that. Well, and wouldn't you have them as like an employee or you'd have them somewhere, I would think, as someone who does that, so they'd have all of the background check and so forth done in advance. Like and that's the, one other thing just to clarify is the change of control is really about the finance, the sort of like financial interest holder type of control. In other words, um, are you a beneficial owner, basically, meaning you have 10% stake? It does not have anything to do with the operations of it. So if somebody needs to step in operationally, that's not going to invoke the change of control issue. So they would need to, though, be a licensed employee. And then, but, yeah. So, um, Temporary so. cards, though, we're, we're giving out with a pretty low barrier to entry. So if there is some, like, serious situation, it could be done in a day. There's nothing in our process that would really hold people up for a temporary card if that's the issue. I think if any any of these worst case gets hurt, sick, cannot participate, if those come up, you know, we can we, we can respond according yeah. accordingly yeah. I, as I, they come up. I think our guidance might be that you would want to think ahead for these sorts of patients. <laughs> yeah, and this is part of business planning. Family members yeah. Just step ahead, step ahead. yeah. And yeah, and if, if that sort of situation does ultimately require a change of control, they would have time to do that, I yes. guess, part of the point too, because it is limited to the financial type of control. Um, allowing um, co for co-located cannabis establishments, allowing people to go above tier six. We do have some accommodation to that at our discretion, I think. Yeah, again, I think as it stands, you can't, but I think depending on the, the situation with which you're trying to create and incubate, right. we might allow that. And I think Right. Often with these kind of waivers, as we've discussed, and folks have given us input, what does a satisfactory waiver consist of? And that's just something we're going to have to work out and, right. and guidance so people are clear and it's not super subjective. Mm -hmm. Agreed. All right. Um, 2.3 regulations applicable to cultivators. Does this section apply to dispensaries? medical dispensaries. And David, can you just remind us, you know, if dispensaries seek an integrated license and they're subject to integrated license rules, they're subjecting themselves to that. That's right. Whenever they are behaving as a, well, whenever they're doing something that is intended for the commercial market, even if some operation is both for the commercial market and for the dispensary, um, they'll have to fi follow our rule to general rules. Um, they do get, you know, obviously, if say there's a manufacturing operation that is also producing for a dispensary, they can lawfully produce a different level of concentrate, for example. But in all other ways, they have to follow the um, the general rules we sent out for everybody for manufacturing. To take an example, so I don't think that this comment needs any further clarification then. I think that I don't think so. I do think that this is a piece that we're just going to have to explain clearly. The statutes aren't perfectly. Uh, I mean, I think that they lead to what we've done. It's not perfectly clear on its face. But yeah, what we've effectively done is just I don't think it needs further change. It's clear. I think we've tried to create a system that's pretty clear that if you're once you're an integrated licensee, you've got to follow all the commercial market rules whenever you're behaving uh, or whenever you are operating for the commercial market. There's a few comments around applying our tier one waivers to 
license types that have not been statutorily created yet. So I think we can just deal with all those all at once, which yeah. is when they are created, if they are created, then we'll have to develop rules before we can actually allow them to operate. And we can decide at that point right, where they fall, where they fall. Um, so information obtained 2.3.6 C information obtained from inspections at non cultivator cannabis establishments may inform inspections at cultivator licensees. And then the comment is that this information should be objective, not hearsay. Truth is, is that all complaints and all information received, I think, can be the basis for an investigation. So I don't think, you know, that we need to make any special changes here. Yeah, I don't, I don't see how enforcement action would be taken on that specific hearsay as it's being referred to here alone. You know, it just lead to further yeah. discussion right. and conversation. And we built in some rules around that in our compliance and enforcement rule. Basically, you can get a complaint from anywhere, but you can't, the board couldn't um, violate somebody solely on the basis of a complaint. There has to be an additional investigation or some other fact gathering that happens. So that's taken care of in rule four. Um, the sampling limits are too low for cultivators and cultivator employees. I mean, I don't think we can reopen that right now. Um, I think they're fine where they are. I think the sampling limits where they are have, have found to not be um, problems with diversion in those limits in other states. And I think we should just keep them where they are now. And if, you know, folks are limited in their ability to sample and get products for commercial use, we can we can revisit it if we hear a lot about it down the road, you know, like where they're at right now. Um, 2.4.4 um, about visibility from a public road, the crop, cannabis crop. So eliminate this. Um, I don't think we can really do that. Um, I think if we're looking at legislative intent and our views on fencing. Yeah. I think, you know, without this, our views on fencing become a little bit more front and center, and I'd rather these crops be protected through a natural barrier mm -hmm. than yeah. requiring super high fences with barbed wire and so on and so forth. So it's just where we're at right now. Yep. Another thing on mixed light. That way. Um, requiring indoor cultivators to comply with CBEs is too onerous, essentially. I would I would just say again, this only applies to new buildings. Yeah. And I don't think we have the my opinion, and I mean, we haven't got David to weigh in yet. I don't think we have the ability to weigh CVs. That's strictly with PSD. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I'm just reading the next one. Um. The 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 comments around HVAC systems essentially is like this is too uh, too burdensome. We waived all these comments in the first year for small yeah. cultivators already. Yep. Yep. For energy efficiency standards, two energy uses reporting reduction rules. We talked about that. Yeah, we talked about that. Um, fire and safety code. We can't really do anything to waive those. Yep. So that's, I mean, we can't change other regulatory authority. No. We can only do what we, what we can do. Um, employee samples, I think there's another just that certain types of licensees might need higher sampling allowances, but we talked about that. Um, regulations applicable to retailers. This is again, about future license types. So we'll deal with them when they're create when and if they're created. So if there's an age limit on cannabis, is there an age verification that should take place at the time of sale? I thought we did that. Yes. We require on entry, places. yeah, entry yeah. and sale. Yep. Okay. And then the rest we've done. It's all just the uh, testing stuff that I brought up when Kara was here. Okay. So, so sorry, Pepper. I realized there was two other things that you had circled back to in our old in our big compilation document too. Yeah. Do you want me to do that now or? Sure. Okay. 
we're getting there. Almost done. You wanted to circle back on the sampling requirements, comprom potentially compromising the security of a grower's developed genetics. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is the... The taxonomic yeah, issue. 2.3.6D. Very recommended. We leave it in. All right. All right. And then disposable vape pens, do you want to provide anything particular about that? Prohibit them or not? Single use plastic. I mean, what would yeah. be made of paper, right? Like it's. <laughs> yeah. I think this is. This will be resolved by the single use plastic issue. I think. Right. All right. Um, so let's go to the um, criminal history section. Yeah, I thought about this a little bit more yeah. after our conversation last week, and I do think we should include um, chapter sixty-four, which is the child exploitation pieces. Okay, because those are technically nonviolent crimes. Right. Uh, so they would, we would not be looking at them, but we'll bring them in. So we will look at them. We can still overcome the presumptive disqualification. Right. Um, but That's right. And it gets rid of any argument about whether they're violent crimes or not, which is a yep. somewhat undefined uh, concept. But, um, but yeah, and it's also not listed, which is odd, but it's not. So it doesn't get captured by anything else clearly. So that'll end any ambiguity on that. I didn't pick up what you were putting down before. Sorry, no, I don't want to this. <laughs> I mean, it's hard, it's hard <laughs> to jump into this. Um, okay. Uh, warning labels um, and standard symbol. There's a comment that we should change the any word said this product, you know, may you know, have psychoactive effects or this product may impair your ability to drive to change that to cannabis and or cannabis products. Um, just so if it was a warning label that's on, for instance, a flyer for a store, there's no confusion amongst the members of the public that don't eat this paper. Don't eat, <laughs> yeah, that it's <laughs> right. Not to be mean. Well, we couldn't have Kinder eggs for a long time. So, <laughs> so the Department of Health as you can imagine, is swamped. I reached out to um, our two advisory members that represent um, kind of public health or both employees at AHS. Um, and um, they suggested just don't change anything in them. We've approved them. We went through a process. Just leave them alone. Um, so with respect to the health warning, we're going to leave that the way it is, or that's my recommendation. Um, with respect to the symbol, um, they didn't specifically get back to me on the symbol, but Julie, if you can remind me, they their recommend the public health recommendation to us and what the Department of Health approved was actually alternative symbols, and they gave it to us to choose. Correct. They approved two, yeah. and we picked one. So the comment that we received is essentially use the other one, because if you look at it, it's very similar, the two, and I can pull them up if you want. I have them like ready to go, but they're essentially identical. I the, think the yellow one. I think the um, ASTM approved one um, is a black triangle and not a red triangle. Oh, okay. Maybe it's the difference. Okay. Should I pull them up? Yeah. I don't remember what the I other I don't one remember. Is. Do we care enough or should we just keep it the, the way that one? So the, the benefit of the ASTM one is that it is approved by ASTM. So if there is a movement to have um, change across the week, that eventually that would be the likely to be that symbol or something similar. Right. We could be saving folks some money in the long run because they would already be using this symbol if that does happen. But the one that we did choose is sort of regionally consistent. So that's the, and I don't have a particular, you know, strong feeling about one or the other. Okay. So this is the one that was unanimously approved, I think last week yeah. as the now kind of international, or at least the American standard symbol for cannabis THC containing cannabis products. Right. Um, only Montana has adopted this um, so far, but again, it, only last week was it approved and it was approved unanimously. This is the one that the Department of Health, and I'll just post that one quickly. So they said that we should choose either the white one at the bottom or the yellow one. Mm -hmm. So, the, um, just to add, the reason why they did two is there was a concern that the yellow wouldn't stand out against yellow packaging. But 
on the other hand, this other label was approved by people who specifically look at right. labeling. So I trust that they sort of know what they're doing and they vetted it through hundreds of members, right? Yeah. Thousands yeah. of members. It was unanimously approved by thousands of members, but the voting committee was 280. Okay. Yeah. So it was, but it was 280 of the voting members. It was unanimous to approve yeah. the one on the left. So, you know, in some ways I kind of just, because it is different than the the red background, and if you look, the leaf is just ever so slightly different. Um, I almost feel like we just leave what we did. The, the, the white one. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I think that's fine. We might have to come back and change it in right. a few years. Yeah, I'm cool with that. Yeah. Okay. Then let's leave it there. Um, okay. Last thing is um, social equity executive session. Do we want to do that now or do we want to take a break now? I could go either way. Do we have the brain power without more nourishment? I'm fine with going now if you guys are. Okay. I'm just pulling up the language that we need to go into executive session. Oh, you do? Yep. Okay. Ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> I move that the Cannabis Control Board go into executive session to consider confidential attorney-client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services to the body and that the executive session is required because premature general public knowledge regarding such communications would clearly place the board at a substantial disadvantage. For a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So what we're going to do then um, before we actually move into executive session is to we're going to pause. Well, we can leave the recording going So I, I don't anticipate this taking a long time. But we're just going to turn our camera off and our microphones off. Um, the people that are going to be in the executive session include David, our general counsel, Bryn um, and Nelly. And um, we're not going to make any decisions there. We're going to hear the advice of our council. We're going to come back and, and make a final decision on the social equity criteria. Anything else I should mention, David? I think that's it. Okay. Well, then, Nelly, would you mind um, maybe just putting up a mm -hmm. an away message that we're in executive right. session? I got it. We're ready to go. Great. All right. Uh, we're back. Um, just for the purposes of the record, um, it's one twenty nine. Um, we're coming back to the Cannabis Board from executive session. Um, we were specifically talking about social equity criteria. As the rule, social equity criteria, the way that we handled it in our rules was really to lift a lot of the um, criteria um, for communities um, that have been impacted by cannabis prohibition from a federal program. Um, because that federal program, um, while there's a kind of strong um, uh, kind of disfavoring of using race-based criteria in um, to assign any sort of advantages or benefits, um, there has been a program that's been upheld federally that uses race-based criteria. Um, the, the consideration that the board was thinking about is, well, it's, it includes a lot of um, it includes a lot of communities that um, haven't actually, we don't have kind of definitive reports or data to show that um, some of these communities have been specifically impacted by the war on drugs. Um, and so, um, but we do have a lot of um, both recent and historic reports, um, both in Vermont and nationally, that show very clearly that Black Americans and Hispanic Americans have been targeted by the war on drugs, selectively policed, um, pulled over at higher rates, uh, arrested at higher rates, charged uh, more severely and sentenced more severely um, that we can kind of point to uh, if this program does get challenged. Um, and so what we discussed in executive session is whether to limit um, the definition, the criteria for becoming a social equity applicant um, uh, which is in 
it's in it's in two places in our rules, but let me just pull up. Uh, so I'm looking at one point one point one point three. Okay. Okay. J. Okay. J. J. Um, did I lose this so quickly? <laughs> oh, it's just there. Not going on. So, um, one way to be a social equity applicant. And I'm looking at a different version than you all are. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So, one way to be a social equity applicant um, is to have been arrested and, and incarcerated for a cannabis related offense. We're not touching that one. Um, what we are touching is um, the first criteria, which is that you're from a community um, who's been historically disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. And that um, you know has a, a statutory site to federal code that includes um, a number of other categories. We want to limit it. Um, the, the kind of the thought in executive session was to limit that um, to um, black Americans, Hispanic Americans, or people from communities that can um, demonstrate that uh, they've been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. You don't want to say anything further about that decision point? Absolutely agree. It's a lot of what the um, social equity subcommittee talked about it. It's in line with the public comment and like you said, the data that we've received and reviewed. Really, the point is not to dilute the social equity program. Not we want it. There's only a fixed amount of money in that cannabis development fund. There's only kind of you know time is our biggest limiting resource as well. So when we say we're going to prioritize and expedite certain applications, that actually has to be meaningful. And so um, you know I think that this change would be in line with everything we know about kind of who's borne the you know, highest burden of the cannabis prohibition war on drugs. Yeah, I mean, I would just say that our definition of in the proposed rules is a little broader, and we think it might have been a little bit more legally defensible, but this is something that we thought we needed to tweak and fine tune a little bit, mm -hmm. recognizing that what happens, happens, right? But we're, this is a place where we should be clear. I think we received public comment specifically around leaving women in, and I think that there are other areas. I mean, there there's prioritization under 903A. Yeah. There's other things that we can do um, around that. Right. Yeah. I think you know we have created a whole separate economic empowerment criteria for people who have been historically underrepresented in um, society, um, and I think women squ fall squarely in that category as well. So um, yeah. All right, um, then David, you have some changes you need to make to um, the final rules. And then, so we should take a break now, come back um, and then really, um, I guess, just review all the final changes and then vote to adopt them as a package. Yes. So why don't we take an hour and 15 minutes for you to do that, which brings us back at 10 to, Three? Am I doing that math right? Yep. All right. So we'll come back at 10 to 3. We'll review the rules as kind of a final package. We'll vote to adopt them and then we'll take public comment. Sounds good. All right. Great. So um, welcome back, everyone. Uh, let's see. It's 2.53 p.m. January 31st, 2022. Um, we're resuming our um, regular meeting of the Cannabis Control Board. And, um, you know, just Given, you know, where we're at, I think that, um, and given the time, I think it really makes sense um, for us to resolve a few of the unresolved issues that we left, um, that we still have left, uh, and kind of close this process out and have David do a final walkthrough, um, just showing us all the changes, what we decided on Wednesday, um, and then us voting on Wednesday. And I say that because um, once we vote on this and send it over to LCAR, our flexibility is gone. Um, and I think we really do need to just make sure that we don't rush that this last phase of what we get to do. Um, 
But I, that being said, I will. I said it at the beginning of the meeting. I will say it again right now, just to be clear. The public comment window on rules one and two has closed. It's been closed for a while, actually, but we haven't been as strict, I guess, about that or as clear, maybe. Um, and so any comments we receive, um, you know, from here on out, uh, we will consider, of course, but we're not going to consider them the way that we have been um, following this format where we have David kind of walk us through them and we decide whether or not um, they apply. We just we that 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 phase of kind of rulemaking has now passed. We um, clean it all up now. <laughs> right. Yeah. We just can't you can't sit um, on these rules, honestly, any day longer than is absolutely necessary. Um, and we can, of course, revisit all of these rules next year. I assume we will revisit them, you know, almost as soon as they go into effect, we'll start to revisit them. So that being said, rules three and four, the comment period window is open. So please, you know, um, anyone who's paying attention, please turn your attention to rules three and four. Make sure we get those right. Um, does that sound good, Julian, Kyle? Sounds like a plan. David? Yep. Bryn? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Great. And 10 a.m. I think you're thinking of on Wednesday. 10 a.m. on Wednesday. Um, that's right. That's what I was thinking. Um, okay. So uh, I think the first issue we need to resolve is um, for outdoor cultivation tiers, I, we've decided to apply a plant count equivalency. Um, and the question I think that we should just be clear with is are people allowed to grow either that canopy size that we've laid out or plant count or some combination of both? Um, I think it needs to be either or, at least for the first year, I believe so that too. those our inspectors and can have something to. And it sounds to me like from an inspection and regulatory standpoint, straight plant count is probably the easiest um, on our end. And honestly, I feel like it gives the most flexibility to cultivators. They can they can grow a lot more plants. Yeah. With this with this yeah. plant count definition. So um, keep in mind, of course, that the canopy, pursuant to some of our other rules, has to be surrounded by a fence for the larger tiers. Um, so there is some kind of limitation on that. And, um, you know, just as always, you know, other regulatory authorities may come into play the bigger you get. Um, and we're, what we're saying is if, if that, if you happen to trigger Act 250 or other um, kind of regulatory authority, you know, it's, it's on you to figure that out. Um, and we're going to require that you do that and that you're in compliance. But um, we're not going to kind of help people come into compliance with Act 250 if they the thresholds. Uh, for one point of clarification, just for Tier 1 outdoor, uh, are we going to, my understanding, we're thinking about the BAT 1 doing an equivalency uh, where it's both because of the statutory definition right. of small cultivator. We don't want to accidentally pull the tier one people out of the statutory definition. Yes. OK, so yeah, just as a point of clarification. Tier one, the thousand square foot outdoor, it could be either or up to a thousand square feet or 125 only because that definition is set by statute. And so um, we don't have a lot of flexibility there. However, we will say that the equivalent plan count could apply, but it, it's, it's an either or there for all the other ones. It's just a straight plan count. Sounds good. Um, so if we go to straight plan count, um, David, I'm curious whether we need to add some, you know, we got a comment just when we were discussing this earlier in the day into our inboxes. I know I dissuaded us from considering <laughs> additional comments at this point, but it really said, do we need to add in the definition section, a definition of total plant canop canopy um, kind of indicating that um, outdoor cultivation is a is a plant count and indoor is a square footage. I don't think so. I mean, plant canopy is defined in statute. I think if we try to redefine it anyway, it'll be at best confusing, at worst in violation of the statute. Okay. And um, plant canopy, that definition is really matters for 
for outdoor small cultivators and for indoor people generally, because you're going to be doing a square footage for the indoor folks. And, and messing with that, I think, is liable to pull us out of the statute or potentially put us in violation of the statute. Okay, great. Thanks, right. David. Um, excellent. Okay, so now we are going to leave um, the conversation, clean up the mixed cultivation tiers a little bit, uh, which I think makes some good sense. We honestly were just picking plant equivalencies kind of at random. And I think that um, sounds like Bryn and uh, Kyle, you clean that, that up a little bit. So could you just walk us through, um, Kyle, what, what you're thinking for the mixed cultivation tiers? Yeah, do you want to start at the first one? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to have five different mixed cultivation tiers. And I think what this does is this, um, you know, it's really... Well, let's just let's just go through them. So the mi first mixed cultivation tier has a indoor canopy size of a thousand square feet and 125 plants. Mixed cultivation two has an indoor canopy size of a thousand square feet and 312 plants. Mixed cultivation number three has a thousand indoor canopy size and 625 plants. Mixed cultivation four again a thousand feet. 1,250 plants and mixed cultivation five, a thousand square feet for indoor and 2,500 plants for outdoor. Okay. Again, like from my perspective, you know, I think I think folks that are are growing outdoors need some accommodations indoor. I think I've heard enough of folks in from folks that at a certain point indoor they're not necessarily interested. And outdoor, I think this kind of helps further incentivize outdoor production, recognizing that there is a small indoor canopy size that's necessary um, for that outdoor production to maintain the viability of your of your operation um, in the short and long term. And again, we'll 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 revisit these if if we need to. And so those those plant counts equate to a tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, tier five outdoor they so you know there's a little bit of logic to it it's essentially right because people by statute are not allowed to have an indoor license and an outdoor license what we're saying is all the outdoor licenses have the option of having a thousand square feet indoors correct yeah okay are you all right with that yes i am all right so then we'll update that and obviously you know we'll have to um fix the fee bill, um, but we can, I think, fix that in the Senate um, when it moves over there, if it moves over. Um, all right. Uh, another issue that is outstanding um, is around, I forgot that we did not address family members um, that are potentially, and maybe not, maybe it's not limited to just family, um, that are under 21 um, at cannabis establishments. And the way that I kind of see that this is obviously a, a hot button political issue. Um, you know, there's just an outright ban on it, right? I think in by statute. But the way that I see it is your kid is um, child care center is closed. And what are you supposed to do? Um, and so I think, you know, exposing kids to cannabis and cannabis products is the fear. But I do think that there's ways that we can write our rules that would allow certain areas of a cannabis establishment to accommodate um, having people under 21 in them. Okay. Is that? Yes, agreed. I was just looking at the section in the um, legislation where it just says where cannabis is located. Right. Yeah. So I think that's the distinction that we would want to make, which mm -hmm. is for the purposes of... 866? Yeah, yeah I think... Youth shall not be permitted in cannabis establishments where cannabis is located. Something along the lines. Um, so so if there is like a back office um, at a retail store or anywhere, a kid could be permitted in there. Um, right. But that um, they just can't be kind of exposed to the cannabis or cannabis products. Okay. Does that seem okay, David, from a drafting? I think that's fine. I mean, um, yeah, I think that's fine. We can put that in the visitors section. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, I think that makes sense. 
I know we were kind of springing this on you, but do you think that we're running afoul of the statute as far as you can tell? You can um, answer that later. Yeah, let me take a look and think about it for a second. I'd already, I had already put in that, um, and I think we discussed this for visitors for home occupancy businesses. There's already a carve out that says that um, for the visitors sections, um, the visitor, the restrictions on visitors only apply to the areas where cannabis is kept. So for home occupancy, you tried to already carve it out because obviously families and friends are going to be around. Um, but yeah, I'll try to figure something out on this piece too. Okay. Um, are you able to pull up kind of what you did around around plastics in in the packaging section? Is yeah. That, let me uh, let me do that right now. Thank you. If we need to change it, it's better to let David know now as opposed to. On Wednesday. Just one second. Well, David's doing that. Are there other other things that we have not addressed yet? I'm sure there are. But I'm sure there are too. But I think it's progress, not perfection. Yeah. yeah <laughs> that we're good. looking for today. You'll just want to finalize, uh, unless you already did finalize the um, tolerance for. But you already agreed to accept carries. Yeah. Right, right. OK. Um, so on the packaging piece, the whole packaging structure has been reworked from the way it was before in response to the interest supply chain issue. So there's basically one initial packaging section that applies throughout. And all that really says is all that really applies to is the um, interest supply chain stuff. And then in the second in the next sections where packaging for each of the licensees is, it says, Interest supply chain, you have to follow that provision. And then for retail, for things that are destined for consumer retail, you have to follow some additional rules, which are different depending on which C you are. Um, so what I'm thinking is that in the initial section, I'll add something else that basically says that um, the initial section will now become applicable both to interest supply chain and then one provision that will be applicable to all of the consumer destined stuff and that will be the packaging provision and uh, the packaging provision will say something it'll be pretty simple we'll put the definition of plastic in the definition section and then there'll basically just be a single sentence that says packaging intended for retail sale or intended uh yeah, intended for retail sale. I may change that phrase slightly to match some of the other phrasing I've used. Um, shall be reusable and shall not be plastic. And that's pretty much what I have. Pretty straightforward. Uh, and uh, following pretty precisely Pepper's recommendation. So no, no plastic, even the cap. That would I like of a. Of a I think yeah, I, I think so. And I think what I would like to do is in guidance, really give people some options, some specific options as in, you know, I really think kind of a tear resistant kind of like coffee bag, you know, that rolls down and can kind of seal um, the seal may have to be a little bit more substantial than what's on a coffee bag. But I think that that could qualify, you know, just really try and think of, um, you know, options. And then, David, we were also wanting, I think, to include that section from Colorado about. That's already in. Yeah. In okay. Yeah. That, that was put in under the retail section. So you okay. can review that. About collecting consumer waste and having the ability to um, clean and reuse it if the child proofing has not been, if it's still kind of sufficient yep. for its purpose. I mean, it's controversial. But I think that it, this is one of those things that actually will become less and less controversial mm -hmm. over time. And, and I, I think that Vermont was able to, I know it's not a regulated, you know, the kind of single use plastic that we banned in Vermont isn't for regulated products. But I think that I think that the market will respond in a positive way, um, as in it will fill the void if we require this. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Okay. I was thinking a little bit more about the energy reporting stuff yeah. during lunch. And so one of the other things I think we've discussed, kicked around, and I hope to still do, is after we get through 
you know, the rulemaking, um, majority of the rulemaking process is to start to look at programs that we want to happen um, that furthers certain goals that we have that we've outlined as priorities for us. And you know, whether that's a sustainability program or, so, or something along those lines, I know other states have specific programs because you can't claim organic in this industry, in this state, because it's a federally defined term that cannabis is not, a, that high THC cannabis is not eligible for. So, and especially with the, the marketing issues that we're going to run into with the 15%, how can we create programs that allow certain folks to take advantage of, of other ways to market their product? Meaning I have a Vermont Cannabis Control Board backed, you know, from an, a sustainability perspective product that that, that can help them market. So what I was thinking, we could take all of those reporting, those data reporting, that whole section out and use that as one of the foundational pillars of the sustainability program. If you're willing to give us the data to show your energy, and this is just hypothetical. I, I think it belongs in our program, but I'm just trying to, again, you know, recognize the onerous on the reporting is one of the things that we could look to do in our sustainability program. If I can still start to develop that in the coming months um, is to put a lot of those types of elements of what we want to do into that program. So if you're giving us a lot more information, you get the gold star or the green star or whatever the achievement is. California has their own little organic program. And I know specific counties in, in uh, Colorado and stuff have programs like these. I, I'm just throwing it out as a option. I kind of like where the reporting requirements are, but it was another thing that I was contemplating while we were um you know eating lunch yeah it's fine i i kind of feel so we've exempted um small cultivators um and from water. all but the kind of energy usage reporting mm -hmm. um and i just feel like anyone else who's really kind of above that level has the ability to report on this stuff absolutely and i was just kind of starting to brainstorm and sketch out in my head what are the pillars of that program going to be i mean we're wrapping up this <laughs> thing and i'm like okay what's my next uh you know task in front of me and i mean there's many of them obviously but you know as far as a programmatic task for this adult use side of our program um and so it was just a thought that kind of occurred um, and that, that section right requires um requires cannabis establishments to like report but it doesn't necessarily require action right or it requires identifying it, 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 ways to improve but it doesn't necessarily say and you have to improve by this much so you, there's no yeah there's no, yeah maybe that's the hook that, that that would be appropriate there because i think what it does is it asks for you to explore opportunities it asks for you to tell us where you are now but it doesn't require you get to a certain you know net savings on your energy usage or whatever the case may be so maybe that's how we draw that line but it was just kind of thinking while i was eating you know how can we further help folks i think this program will from a number of different you know ways but just future thought i think that that's a better kind of line in the sand than um, the next step yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, nervous about shutting down the conversation, but I guess there's always Wednesday. Um, all right. Well, um, David, do you have anything else for us that you need clarification on or um, that you'd like further discussion about? I don't think so. Uh, I think we pretty much covered it. I would just note for the board members, um, as you're getting ready for Wednesday, make sure that what you expected to be in there is in there, especially on the packaging stuff. I want to make sure that that all fits together because you made a lot of changes. We're making more today. So check that in particular, but check everything. OK. And are there any areas in your drafting that kind of leave some ambiguity that you won't need us to look at today um, to, on Wednesday? Not that I can think of at okay. this particular moment. OK. Yeah. OK. All right, um, then why don't we uh, take public comment? Um, and uh, as always, uh, you know, feel free to, if you join via the link, raise your virtual hand if you'd like to make a comment. Um, 
and we'll um, start with people that join by the link, and then we'll move to people that may have joined by the phone. So, um, looks like first up is Jay Green. Hi there. Um, my name is Jay Green. I use they them pronouns. I'm a policy uh, public health policy consultant for the Hartford Community Coalition. I just have a quick question um, on something that was mentioned earlier. Um, my question was that um, there was a mention that there would need to be a local cannabis control board uh, established in order for local retail licensing to occur. And is that a requirement under the under the current regulations or would responsibility for regulation just delegate to the state if a local board was not established? So um, we don't traditionally answer questions during the public comment period. Oh. Um, only because it just then turns into a kind of an ask me anything sort of situation. But David, is there a kind of just very, is there a statutory site you can give that would um, kind of answer that? Yeah. Um, if you look at Title Seven, um, the, uh, the section is 863. It talks about the local control boards and in uh, the local, yeah, local cannabis control commissions is what they call it there. And it does provide that they do get to have a say, but if they don't exist, then it's solely the board's um, decision-making on licensing. Of course, they were, towns always retain the ability to regulate any business uh, in accordance with their bylaws. But um, but yeah, that that's the deal with the local control commissions. And if you have more stuff, as the chair said, uh, always just feel free to send us um, stuff through the various um, links on the website for contact points. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do have one comment, which is that um, I don't see a current uh, regulatory framework for the prevention funding from cannabis uh, excise taxes to be distributed. And um, I was wondering if you could comment on um, what your plans are for uh, that prevention funding and what uh, what infrastructure might look like for getting the prevention funding to places like the Hartford Community Coalition for Youth Cannabis Prevention. Great, thanks Great, for the comment. Um, so next on the list is uh, Phil Schilling. All right, hello everybody, Phil here. Uh, thanks for another great meeting. Um, just want to do comment real quickly on packaging. Um, there is a company called Tree Hugger Containers that sell glass jars with uh, plastic childproof lids for flour. Um, the plastic lids are 100% reclaimed ocean uh, plastic lids. And it says that they, they have zero single use plastics. I guess based on this conversation, I wasn't sure whether that would be allowed um, with the no plastics. And I also had just like another uh, general kind of clarification. The law states that the packaging needs to be opaque and child resistant. Um, does the container need to be both of those things? So can I have a clear glass jar inside of a cardboard box, in which case the entire package is opaque, yet you can take the glass jar out that has the uh, child resistant packaging on it. Um, and so I guess I just was wondering if we'd be able to use something like that. And then just a, a further comment on packaging in general. I mean, it takes three months to produce cannabis, three weeks to dry and cure it, and it gets ruined in about three days or less um, due to poor packaging. And so uh, making sure we have uh, available packaging that can, you know, be uh, properly resistant to air and light uh, to protect it is very important from a brand perspective to make sure that quality is there for our consumers. Um, and I think that's all I got. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Um, Jesse, old growth, organic, organics. Hi, guys. Thanks for the meeting and all your hard work. Um, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, and you guys probably don't want to hear it, but I need to at least make the comment um i'm i'm sh was shocked um that you guys just switched the mixed tiers to a thousand foot indoor um i 
yeah, I just I feel like it's a real missed opportunity for the things I have discussed before, but ultimately for sustainability and um, moving people more towards outdoor, I feel like you're doing the opposite of what your intention even is in this. So, for example, um, as I've mentioned before, there are products that the market uh, demands, indoor flour being one of them, concentrates being another one, or edibles. Um, the least energy uh, consumption way to do that is to grow outdoor for concentrates in edibles because you don't you can just grow a lot more of them. You don't have to baby them as much because you're not looking for this like quality indoor flower. Um, so you can grow outdoor and save energy that way and then have some indoor. But because of our whole canopy issue where um, the legislature did not define it for vegging and flowering, by keeping it a thousand square feet all the way up, when you're increasing your plant count, you're either one, you're not targeting small businesses, how you guys initially attended with the mixed tiers. Um, but then also you're you're kind of favoring outdoor. Like someone can grow 2,500 plants outside and then you're, you know, but then you also get a thousand foot indoor. Um, it also doesn't, um, it doesn't help with the, the vegging issue. So like if you have 300 plants outside, usually you want to start your babies indoor when it's still frost so you can get a good size in them um but you're not going to be able to do that with these mixed tiers so anyways i hate i hate this for you guys because i know i don't know if i missed a meeting and you guys explained why you were trying to keep it at a thousand because before even when you had three tiers which was something to work with at least for the first year you guys still kept it a thousand from tier one to tier two so I don't know if I missed something. I hate harping on you guys because you guys are trying to pay attention to so many details. Um, but I got to make this last comment because, I mean, it's the time is now. <laughs> and uh, so just please take please consider uh, changing that and just making it simple, even just sticking with what you had before if you need to. So you give people the option of having indoor and outdoor to some extent. Um since we can't have double licenses. Um, so anyways, thank you guys. I do really appreciate what you guys are doing over there. All right, that's all, thanks. Thanks, Jesse. Um, Rick, Rick Fox. <laughs> well, um, perfect timing, I guess. Uh, I wanna say thank you uh, for the decision that uh, uh, I guess Jesse's concerned about. Uh, I think your decision uh, really, um, makes outdoor cultivation a viable proposition in Vermont. And I don't think it would have been there before. So that's fantastic. Um, and I do appreciate that the mixed tier will allow uh, a thousand square feet is sufficient for any outdoor cultivator up to 2,500 plants to maintain growing stock, uh, mother plants, propagate clones, um, at whatever point in the year they choose. So, so I think, I think that's great. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, if there's a concern that the uh, that the mixed tiers top out at a thousand square feet indoor, um, you know, again, I, you know, I think to me, you know, I, I think there's plenty of opportunity in the other tiers uh, for indoor. Uh, they'll have all the density that they want there. So, so I'll, I'll say that I, I, I think I appreciate where Jesse's coming from, but uh, maybe if we uh, sharpened our pencils and did the math, um, maybe, maybe uh, some of her concerns would be resolved too. So, so uh, Jesse, let's talk sometime. Maybe, um, maybe I can understand better where you're coming from. But mainly, uh, thank you uh, because I think you just made outdoor uh, a viable proposition in Vermont. So, um, very much appreciate it. Thanks, Rick. Um, Fine Bud Farms. Yeah, hey guys, uh, thanks for taking my call. Just wanted to uh, touch on the packaging as far as what the person earlier was saying. With uh, tree huggers, yeah, they do really well. I just wanted to show this, but the um, the tops are made by Santa, S-A-N-A. -A. Uh, they're out of Colorado also. But um, they're, if you have arthritis, you know, it's pretty good. It's like a child resistant, but they are 100% uh, percent reclaimed ocean plastic which i think is is, is pretty great um and i, I just want to let y'all know it's very hard 
to find anything really sustainable that's not a plastic top. Um, you know, I've been looking and requesting samples. The tree huggers also, they, uh, they do things that opaque, you know, if they want, and then they label them for you. But um, and their glass is 48%, you know, for anybody that's out there trying to find something. The sun's really bright. Uh, anyway, that's all. Um, thank you all. And uh, have a good one. Thank you. Um, next on my list is uh, Tree Frog Farms. Hey guys, what's up? Um, thank you for everything you've been doing. Um, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. I was hoping that as we write up, um, you were saying the tier one outdoor, you were going to be doing a, a thousand square feet or the plant count. I just like to make sure that that isn't written to be misunderstood where someone, if, you know, if I have a hundred plants, but it reaches over a thousand square feet that someone says, no, it's, you know, one or the other, whichever you hit first so that it is decided and chosen upon. There's no, you know, iffiness there. Um, now, as, as far as the mixed tier, it seems like you've kind of used the mixed tier to compensate for the vegging for the outdoor. So I just want to make sure and be clear that if I'm a tier one mixed cultivator, then that allows me the freedom to also flower indoors during the winter to be able to recoup some of my loss, keep my business going. Cause that's, that's how I read it and interpret it. Um, other thing is uh, simple grow tents set up for vegetation. I'd like to make sure that those aren't considered new buildings and end up falling into some kind of regulation that might be burdensome, especially for tier one growers. Cause I'm pretty sure we're all going to be using something kind of like that. And besides that, that's all I can really think of. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else uh, that would like to make a public comment? I don't see anyone that joined by phone. So again, if you'd like to make a comment, please just raise your virtual hand. I'll just give it a, a quick sec here. Um, okay, so why don't we um, close the public comment period? Um, is it worth just addressing quickly some of the issues that came up? I think, you know, we're at the point where people are really looking for a little bit of clarity. And we, it's now. Yeah, it's the time is now. <laughs> um, the Sorry, department, hear. the allocation for substance misuse prevention funding is not something that the board has any control over at all. Um, the legislature will decide that and, and it's not, there's not a lot of clarity in the statute, but I assume in consultation with the Department of Health. Um, but we, we don't have any, any control over how that money gets allocated. Um, the single use plastic or the, the kind of plastic lids from tree hugger, we'll obviously take a look at that and see if that's something. Yeah. I mean, the website looks cool and, and I guess I need to further familiarize myself with the single use plastic ban that we've yeah. got in Vermont already. I don't, I mean, this is saying it's not single use, it's reclaimed yeah. plastic. So I think that would be okay on first read, but I, I would want to make sure that we're not creating more problems than it's a single use. I use it once and then I can toss it. Not that it came to me recycled. The single use definition is that it's intended for kind of disposal after its use it, by law. But again, like I think really there's so many buzzwords in this industry that people right. have their own definitions for. And I don't mean that condescendingly. It's just, you know, it's like sustainability means something different to everybody, you know, so. I agree with the concern that childproof packaging usually involves some kind of plastic lid. Uh, so I think we do have to kind of think about that. But I, I'm willing to say that I've, I've seen packaging that does not involve any plastic that meets single use certification in other states uh, or uh, kind of non-plastic or child resistant packaging. I, I, you know, I think it's good for us to kind of plant our flag and see what happens, but um, I'm I'm not saying that I can't be persuaded otherwise. But um, anyway, well, let's just I'll do our yeah you know our research and then yeah. if we have to adjust on Wednesday we can. Okay. Um, the uh, opaque requirement we'll just have to clarify that in statute whether the jar itself has to be opaque or if the packaging that you're taking home is opaque that 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 can satisfy that to me. <laughs> that right. to me seemed like a creative way to 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 
skin the cat, I guess. But yeah, or you could put something paper inside the glass jar, right? So yeah, okay. there's a lot. There'll be a lot of ingenuity in this in this space. I can tell you that. Um, the la the very last point, Kyle, but then I'm going to turn it back to you uh, for Jesse's point. Uh, the very last point uh, about whether the tier one mixed cultivator, that thousand square foot indoor, can be used for flowering. I, I, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, all right. So, just if you want to maybe quickly just talk about the decision to um, kind of change course on mixed tier cultivation. I think you know. I think Rick kind of um, answered our perspectives. I think the mixed tiering is is it's designed to meet people where they're at, but it is, I think, from my perspective, designed to to help our outdoor growers versus our indoor growers. And I can certainly appreciate how some folks want to see opportunities to advance and move up a tier as they develop you know their business contacts in this market and maybe that's something we can look to when we reopen the rules as soon as we file them <laughs> so um but i think you know from the mixed light perspective from trying to change a narrative that exists about outdoor because i think we've got a lot of good quality outdoor growers in this state um i think this gives them another tool in their tool belt um so you know from that perspective, I'm kind of in Rick's camp there. I think that this is really designed to help our outdoor cultivators and help outdoor, you know, products and high quality outdoor grown flower really thrive in Vermont. That's that's our intention. So it's not going to please everybody, but nothing we do pleases everybody. And we didn't get rid of the other three. We added a fourth, right? We did change something. There, there was at one point, and Jesse's right, there was one point where there was a couple mixed tier options and one was a 2,500 yeah. square foot indoor. And I can't remember what the plant count alternative was. And, you know, I think the way things are going, it's, it's a little bit more clarity from a regulatory perspective on what's going on for us to be able to implement. And again, the mixed tiering is designed to help our outdoor growers more so than anything, I think. All right. Um, well, any last comments um, from board members or from Brandon or from David uh, before we adjourn that we need to think about before Wednesday? No. Something will occur and I'll bother Brandon at 11 p.m. or 7 a.m. <laughs> All right. Well, then um, <laughs> we'll wait for that. Stay tuned. Um, but uh, I guess um, with nothing else on the agenda, I will adjourn this meeting. Thanks everyone who stuck it out online and uh, we'll see you on Wednesday.